one o'clock having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council will come to order and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Palantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, let me see if there are any statements of disqualification that members wish to announce at this time. Seen. Sorry, do I do that yes. Consent items as Certainly. Okay, so Item 17, Active Transportation Plan Outreach Consulting Award Contract. I will be recusing myself as I am um, working directly with Ecology Action per FPPC finance rules. Okay. Council Member Contar Johnson will be recorded as abstaining on item 17 on the consent agenda. Are there further statements of disqualification by members? Seeing here none. We are on the a closed session agenda, which is published, and there are two items on that agenda. Uh, one is a conference with legal counsel regarding liability claims, and the other is real property negotiations. This would be the opportunity for anyone who is either with us in chambers today or online who wishes to comment on the, con the uh, closed session agenda to do so. Is there anyone online, Ms. Bush, who wishes to make a comment? No one with their hand raised, no. Uh, anyone who is with us in chambers, last call. Seeing, hearing none. The City Council will adjourn into closed session in a moment. We will take up the items that are indicated on our agenda, and we will return at approximately 1.30, but not before that. We are adjourned into closed session. Hour of 1.30 having arrived and the City Council having completed its business in closed session, we are returning to session and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Brunner? Present. Helen Tari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. Mayor Keeley? We're on oral communication. For those of you unfamiliar with it, it is the opportunity for anyone to address the City Council on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. Uh, and uh, you'll have up to two minutes to speak in that regard. So let me see if there's anyone who is with us in chambers. Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Ann Simonton. <laughs> Many of you know me. Um, <clears throat> I want to. Uh, discuss a fact that the City Council is responsible for the Santa Cruz Police Department. And working with the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, I've been on it for six years. Um, <clears throat> it's hard for me to discuss this, but I think it's important for, our, for the public to know that the Santa Cruz Police Department has not been logging uh, appropriate rape rates in our city. This could be going on for as many as 10 to 12 years. We don't know. Um, there's not a, a complete investigation, and I'm hoping that the, all of you will take note of this and to be uh, concerned about this uh, egregious error that is, is wrong. Um, <clears throat> my six years on, this, on the uh, commission, I've had a, a, a terrible time working with staff. Terrible. Really bad. Um, they kept files from me. Uh, if people remember Ralph DeMaricut, when he kind of exited the city without much notice, he, uh, he told me that it was due to Susie O'Hara, who was telling him to lie to me about the whereabouts of the files as the chair of the commission. That was <laughs> part of my weird experiences here with the city and with the staff. We've had five different staff liaisons, and we, uh, this has made work really difficult because we need consistency. That's really important for us as a commission. Um, basically, I think that most importantly is that we all want safety in our community. We deserve to have a clear, transparent relationship with the police department. There is conflict of interest on our, our commission that is not being addressed, and that also should be looked into. It should be something that I think the city council should go to and read them the ethics <laughs> guidelines 
Again, because it's clear there's a conflict of interest on two people on the commission who are working. <clears throat> also, uh, I think it's a priority that we get our banners back. They were tossed. We've had files dismissed without being, or tossed without being uh, even put digitized, so we don't have any record. This is really important for our commission to have a sense of our 40, oh, two years now, I think, on as a commission in the city. So um, I don't think I have much more time, but uh, I do want to say that we need a staff person. I, I think it's sad when somebody like myself who's very enthusiastic and passionate about this, who feels diminished, dacked. I've been brought in by Cassie Bronson and given the third degree for bringing up conflict of interest. I don't think that's the way a city should work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else who's with us today wish to comment on under oral communication? Is that what you're waiting for, sir? Please come forward. And hello to the little guys. Yeah. Brought my crew with me. Yeah, it's a good looking <laughs> crew. There you go. Good afternoon. So on March 31st, 2024, my son and I were sailing a wind-powered micromagic model sailboat on the pond at Westlake Park. It's approximately 21 inches long, weighs two pounds, and I was instructed by another park goer that I was not permitted to sail any model watercraft on a city park pertaining to Santa Cruz Municipal City Code 13.08.070. As, as an avid birder, I understand and respect the intent of this code to protect our wildlife and waterfowl in the area. But it's come to our attention that at some point in the past couple of years, a park goer and his children drove a motorized remote control sailboat at Westlake Park, chasing ducks and actually injuring one. Thus, the previous municipal code was enacted with no distinction made between motorized and wind-powered boats. In doing a little bit of research for the injury to waterfowl from my wind-powered boat, I found the following, that basically the boat carries a lot less momentum than a duck does, and so uh, if there were ever a collision between a boat and the duck, the boat would sustain a lot more damage. Um, so I respectfully request that the Municipal City Code 13.08.070 be amended to permit the use of non-motorized boats under two pounds on city park walkways. So this is obviously the boat that we were sailing. And then what my other son is showing here is a picture of the sign at Westlake Park. And it looks as though the rule may have been taped up. I'm not sure if that was an official action made by the city or maybe one of the neighbors. So um, again, looking for consideration to be made as far as an amendment and uh, just more information pertaining to whether this was an official city act. Two things. Thank you for being here. You Young guys, thank you for participating in this. This is a good civics lesson for you, right? You got an issue with your city. You want to look at a law. You're not sure it's really written the right way. Thank you, both of you, young men, for being here. Sir, we're not uh, in oral communication. We so don't go back and forth with you about this. Okay. Here's what I'll tell you. Um, if you leave your name and contact information with the city clerk, either the district council member who represents that district or myself will be in contact with you. Okay? Many thanks. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, nice to see you. Anyone else wish to comment? Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Yeah, good afternoon. Welcome. My name is still James Ewing Whitman. Mr. Ewing, good afternoon. Yeah, you know, it's almost the five-year anniversary for me showing up and making observations and public comments. It seems crazy. Sometimes there were 35 different individuals that were around to support an issue. I don't have three minutes. I have 38 seconds. Am I just given one minute? Excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me. That's okay. That says 29 seconds. This says three minutes. It, we'll go with the one you've got, the longer time. Go ahead. You're doing fine. We'll see. Okay. So it's just amazing to be in observation. You know, I, the recent information, it's amazing how much some of you make a year here. You know, upwards of $700,000 doing what? For Dishery Trust or for Dishery Trust malfeasance? You know, I'm not quite sure if the level of evil in this room or ignorance is actually higher. I wish I could observe differently. Everybody can change. 
So how about we start? You know, you could be a high school graduate, graduate from college, become a nurse, doctor, a PhD, and still be kind of a controlled kid fawn. Like, for example, I think this is kind of important to make this distinction because I am witnessing a great deal of bigotry from some of you coming out of your mouth, which I'm not going to go into detail about. But let's just describe the definition of Semitic adjective relating to or denoting a family of languages that includes Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, and certain, ancl certain other ancient languages. <clears throat> Starting from the main subgroup of Afro-Asianic. So I would think that every human being on the planet matches Afro-Asianic. So people talking about these words anti-Semitic, it's a lot different than um, <clears throat> having some serious questions about what certain individuals have, have done when I don't really want to be censored. I'm not going to be censored. Anyway, it's just interesting to make observations. Thank you. Still don't Thank you, Mr. Time. York. Thank you for being here. Uh, do we have anyone online? We do. Let's take the first person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to Oral Communications at the City Council. Three, two, one. We'll go to the next person online if there is one. There's only one, and he's talking. I don't know if... Um... Well, we can't hear them, so we'll come back to them at some other point. We are, unless there are other folks who wish to present under oral communications, what we're going to do at this point is take something slightly out of order. We are going, I'm going to acknowledge Council Member Newsom uh, under additions and deletions to the agenda. Council Member. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, so this is in reference to item number 29. Uh, so the applicant for that item uh, workbench on Thursday uh, made a number of changes to this project, including the base density, bonus density, inclusion of additional storage units that will be converted to ADUs and requested waivers and concessions. Uh, and another change was then made to this project late or yesterday. And at this point, it seems right to send this project back to the Planning Commission uh, to reassess the project and the various concerns about the project out of fairness to the applicants and the public. So I would like to make a motion that we continue this appeal hearing to the Council's May 28th agenda, and in the meantime, refer this matter back to the Planning Commission at its May 16th meeting for a recommendation on the proposed changes. There is a motion. Is there a second? There is a second by the Vice Mayor. Under discussion, you may open on your motion, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, as I said, this is uh, more just out of fairness to the um, to the appellants and to the public. Uh, there's been a number of changes to made to this project, especially up uh, until yesterday. Uh, so I think uh, this is the right move. Further on into debate or discussion, Ms. Brown, you recognize me? Go, you go, you go. I just have a, a question yeah. because um, I was alerted to the changes uh, that occurred last week, and I, I just am now hearing about a change that was made last night. Is it customary for uh, developers to be resubmitting like this in the context of an appeal? Um, because my understanding is that when there's an appeal in play, um, that changes can't be made. So I, I'm just trying to understand that. There is nothing in our code or under the law that prohibits an applicant from making changes or proposing changes. Oftentimes, it's intended to address concerns raised by members of the public. Um, in, this, in this case, it was due to some miscalculations of the base density and floor area ratios. OK, thank you. Uh, just a follow-up question then. Um, and there's no, were the council not to make this decision today? Um, there, there's nothing that prevents, uh, there's no requirement that we, they have, there's no timeline. There's no, we don't need, get, need to have 72 hours notice or the public 72 hours notice. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm happy to support this motion, but there literally something at the night before a meeting and with an expectation that we hear an appeal with new information, that's, that's allowed. You mean, can nope. we continue the... I understand we, I think we can, yes. but were we not to do this? I'm just trying to understand because it, it just feels very, um, it's frustrating. I think it's very frustrating for the public and um, I'd prefer not to <laughs> be operating in an environment where this kind of thing is, is happening with project by project. So just wanting to 
make sure we're clear that it is allowable for a developer to change and submit revised plans with the expectation that we will consider those with less than 24 hours notice even? It's permissible to it is. make or propose changes. Uh, okay. Yes. I have some follow-up questions for another time about that. Thank you. The vice mayor is recognized. I appreciate um, Councilmember Newsom for proposing this motion. Um, I know he and I and Councilmember Colin Dari Johnson have met extensively with the neighbors. We've heard a lot of their concerns, and some of them we are unable to address due to state laws. But I have to say how frustrated I've been with Workbench and with the owners of the property for being unwilling um, to, to make even minor modifications to appease the neighbors. It just, to me, shows um, a lack of respect and kind of just being bad neighbors. Um, I think it's disrespectful for us and for members of the public as well to make changes at the last minute and expect all of us to be prepared to, at a hearing to uh, make a big decision. And I think moving forward, I know Workbench has several proposed uh, developments coming in, or, in around town. And I just want to make it really clear that um, I hope that you can be better partners in the next projects. I know there's one coming down on Almar, and I didn't hear about it first from anybody except for some neighbors. So you know who we are. You know which districts we represent. Give us the courtesy of giving us a heads up, having neighborhood meetings to include the neighbors from the very beginning before they have to bring it to appeal and nitpick it apart and leave us in an impossible position to make a decision like this. This is really frustrating. And I know that the city of Santa Cruz has the library building that, that they have had countless meetings for. There's the Anton Pacific building that they did tons of buildings, Pack Station North and South. Where's another one that's going in? The, the school district's one that they're building. There's plenty of good neighbors and good developers that want to you know, do what's right by Santa Cruz and build the housing that's needed, but do it in a thoughtful way. And I've been very, very frustrated. And the fact that Workbench even wanted to meet today at 11 a.m. before the meeting, get real. No. Like, meet with me before that. Get real. <laughs> Council Member Watkins is recognized. Yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate the pause for the reasons that have been mentioned. I guess my question is more in terms of process. And so if then returned back to the Planning Commission to be heard, what's sort of the, depending on the outcome, like how does that, what ensues beyond that? The, the proposed motion would provide the Planning Commission with an opportunity to review and comment on the project as revised. Uh -huh. It would come back to the City Council um, at, the 28th, at the May 28th meeting, and that would be to um, avoid having to put the neighbors in the position of appealing the decision again. And so that was the intent behind that motion. So the appeal will continue. Um, the Planning Commission will review the revised project given all of the changes that happened right. last minute. And that will be heard. Um, in anticipation, there won't be even any more additional changes, I guess, beyond that. OK. <clears throat> OK. Thank you. Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson is recognized. Thank you for the motion, Council Member Newsom, and for the second. Um, and I want to echo the comments of my colleague, Vice Mayor Golder, um, and what Council Member Brown brought up. Um, just because it's permissible um, doesn't mean that's a that's the way to behave as a good neighbor. Um, so I'm making a public request um, that if changes are going to be made to the plans that um, we have plenty between now and the Planning Commission meeting on the 16th and then before it comes back to the 28th, that we have plenty of time to review and communicate with the neighbors about it. A day before, we're all supposed to pour in and make a very important decision. Um, just because it's permissible doesn't mean that it's okay. Um, so that's, a, that's an ask, um, and, and I would be happy to meet with Workbench, um, not the morning of the council meeting, but sometime in advance, so that we can make this a good project. Um, like Vice Mayor Golder said, there, there's going to be more projects coming our way. I know that there is a way for us to meet our housing needs and, and grow appropriately, but we've got to do it right. So I appreciate um, the motion, and I will be supporting it. 
Oh, I'm sorry. What? One more thing. Sure. Can I ask um, if the city manager, if you could outline how, the steps that will be taken to make sure that the appellants and everyone involved will know that we're, it, should this pass, that we would be continuing it? I thank you for that question, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. So we have um, a press release ready to go, um, updates on social media next door. Uh, we also have contact information for a number, a number of the uh, neighbors that have engaged in this process along the way, and our communications team will be reaching out uh, pending the council's action this morning. And can I make an additional request that um, the mayor, at, at the opportunities that you get throughout this council meeting, that you make that announcement, just in case some of the other ways don't reach the community? Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Okay. For the debate or discussion, let me see if there's anyone with us. Let me see if there's anyone with us in the public who wishes to comment on the motion. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Rachel Marconi, um, a resident of... Uh, council member Newsom's district and an involved neighbor on this project. And I really appreciate all the time that um, almost all of you have given to our neighborhood and meeting with us. Um, to say the least, we don't trust Workbench. This is clearly a play for them to keep trying to redesign a project that doesn't jump through all the different loopholes that they can find and manipulate the council and your um, legal counsel and the community over and over again. They are not a good faith player in this community is what this process has demonstrated to me. As a member of the community who's been received postcards from the city saying, hey, there's going to be an appeal on the council agenda tonight, and then working with council members to identify an approximate time, knowing that there are probably 100 neighbors that want to show up this evening and have it scheduled in their calendar for weeks now and have been engaging on next door, diving into the details. I don't know how many thousands of hours have gone into trying to understand state law and city codes and all of that stuff. And you guys are brilliant minds to be able to wrap your head around it at all. But it is, I just want to communicate how discouraging it is to members of the public who anticipate and are getting nervous. Even here I am, I'm used to talking to boards, but I'm even getting a little nervous and getting that gumption to show up to a meeting and be a participant in the democratic process and then to be told, maybe they'll read the newsletter. I'm going to guess you're going to have a couple dozen people at the door at 7.15 tonight, though. And so I would encourage the council even if you just have an opportunity to record, like sometimes for CEQA hearings there is, that someone's here to record public testimony at 7.15 tonight. That would be my minimum request. And to call BS on the workbench, submitting new plans on the 24th, submitting new plans today. This is ridiculous. Anyway, that's all I got. Ms. Marconi, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, as to the issue about receiving testimony, we either can or we can't. So we're not having a hearing tonight should this motion pass. The outreach efforts that the city manager has described and my colleague have described uh, will be undertaken and uh, we will be posting information on the door and so on. So I know that this is an inconvenience. I think the gentleman's motion is not about convenience, about getting it right. And so that, that's what the hope is here. Uh, please feel free. Go ahead. The perspective is it's a convenience to workbench. Understood. Our appeal has not changed. The facts that we identified in our appeal of problems with the project that was approved by the Planning Commission, who now we've lost faith in because they didn't identify those problems. And here you had citizen planners who know nothing about housing FARs, I didn't even know what FAR stood for before the Planning Commission meeting, um, you know, are trying to catch up and learn these things. So that's frustrating. And also I do question the inability to have two hearings because I know there are other government actions where you can accept public testimony even if the whole um, board isn't present. But I'll defer to whatever the city's own rules are. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Seeing here, excuse me, someone online? We'll try it. It's the same person from um, from Oral Communication. Oh, yeah, but I don't know if he wants to talk about it now. Uh, We're going to try. I've okay, changed so my person settings. On person online, we are now going to be 
taking testimony on Council Member Newsom's motion relative to item 29. If that is your intent to speak to that item, I'll recognize you. Person online, is that your intent? Okay, matters back before the body. Further debate or discussion? Seen, hearing, yes, Ms. Brown. I, I do have a question just in response to Ms. Morcone's request. Um, uh, is it, what are the legal ramifications in an appeal situation like this if we were to convene and take testimony without deliberating? I think the decision to take testimony is really a, uh, a question for the city council. There wouldn't be any legal prohibition on your doing so. Um, you would not at that point have the benefit of feedback from the planning commission, but um, you know, it's up to the pleasure of the council. Thank you. For the debate or discussion. Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Brunner. Aye. Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. And Mayor Keeley. Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Mr. City Manager, will you pull the trigger on that public information outreach? Thank you. Uh, and uh, Council Member Brunner is recognized. Thank you. I just had a quick clarifying question um, from oral communications. It moved so quickly. I'm sorry, but um, what is the formal process for a commissioner to communicate um, if uh, some actions that there were some specific things brought up? So I just want to make sure the current staff liaison is made aware of that and it goes through its formal process. And also the part about Santa Cruz Police Department not logging rape uh, rates. I would hope that the commission would make a recommendation either to our public safety committee or to the council as a commission. So I just wanted um, to ask the city manager to hopefully have the staff liaison work um, through all that and have that go through the process that we can work through that. Thank you. Our staff liaison, thank you for the question, Councilmember Bruner. Our staff liaison is very aware of the concerns that were raised uh, this afternoon and has been working through the commission process to determine what gets brought forward and what recommendations the commission as a whole would like to have reviewed. Uh, but yes, those concerns have been logged and our staff that are supporting the commission have been working through that with the commission members. Thank Watkins, you. I'm, I'm sorry, will we finish? Thank you. Councilmember Watkins. I apologize if I missed it, but you mentioned you were going to send out social media updates that this has been postponed. I'm wondering if we also want to post something on the door to let folks who might be coming in knowing it's been postponed. We plan to do that as well. Okay. So we'll have it out through socials. We'll have a poster on the door so folks are aware. And we will also be reaching out directly to neighbors that we have contact information for. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Um, I, I don't think I, ha I, I really wanted to echo Council Member Bruner's comment about the um, testimony we heard regarding the way rape cases are reported. And I have been in communication with um, a couple of members of the CPVAW about this. I do think it's, um, there's some complexity there, but I also think that it's important for this council to be um, aware of this and, you know, to ask for some information moving forward once that process is either complete or there's some outcome. I appreciate uh, those comments and concerns, uh, Council Member Brown. And I want to also reiterate that many of the concerns that were shared in uh, that testimony this afternoon, it's my understanding, are also included in a staff report that are coming to the commission this week as part of their meeting. Uh, the questions about what reports are available and uh, how those cases are being tracked within the police department is also an ongoing conversation between our staff our police department and the city attorney's office. And uh, that work is uh, continuing to be um, reviewed. Just if I could, one last thing about that. Thank you. Um, it's my understanding that there's been some conversation with the DA as well. And so I don't know if you're including them, but I think it would be helpful. Yes, I should have mentioned the district attorney's office as well. Thank you. Further discussion on any items? 
We were on uh, item three. These are mayoral proclamations. The first one is declaring May 4th, 2024 as Wildfire Community Prepar Preparedness Day. And I would ask the vice mayor to present on this item. Hi, thank you. So I'm so pleased to present this um, to the fire chief and um, I don't know your title, Shields. <laughs> Division. Division Chief Shields. Um, on behalf of the mayor and this council, um, we, um, the, the, I'll read parts of the proclamation, the, the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, recognizes May 4th as Wildfire Community Preparedness Day, and whereas the NFPA FireWise USA program educates and assists community members in protecting their family members, homes, and neighborhoods from wildfire, and whereas the Prospect Heights and Highland neighborhoods have created firewise communities to strengthen ties with neighbors and work together on vegetation management, home hardening, evacuation plans, and other actions to reduce wild, wildfire danger. Um, um, I am going to skip ahead and say I, Renee Golder, on behalf of the mayor and the council, do hereby proclaim May 4th, 2024, as Wildfire Community Preparedness Day in the city of Santa Cruz. And thank you to all the neighbors that came out and for all of your good work, because you guys are really at that uh, wildland urban interface. And because of neighbors like you, you're protecting all of us that, that don't live there. So many thanks and our gratitude. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Chief, good afternoon. And good afternoon. Rob Odie, the fire chief. I just wanted to say a few things on behalf of both Wildfire Preparedness Day on May 4th, but also on these incredible people behind me. Um, again, um, just to reiterate, May 4th, Wildfire Preparedness Week. Obviously, as we enter into the summer season and wildfire season, just want to remind people to be prepared, um, not only if they live in the wild or urban interface areas to sort of, you know, trim the trees around their homes, clean their gutters, clean their rooftops, their deck areas. More importantly, have a go bag, have a plan. Um, refer them to our website or our fire admin to get a brochure, uh, a, wild, or a preparedness flyer where they can fill that out and have a plan for their family and themselves. It's critically important that they have that plan. Everybody should have a plan. It's unique to their family and to themselves. And so we want to make sure everybody has one. Now, switching um, gears a little bit, I want to speak about these incredible people behind me. Without these folks here, um, this is the foremost example of cooperation and collaboration between the fire department and the community. Without these folks behind me, um, they are literally the front lines, as uh, Vice Mayor Golder has talked about. Um, in 2020, during the CZU, the fire was literally approaching from the north and coming down, and without the preparation that they had done in terms of um, preparing their homes, they actually were able to provide a line of defense for the city itself as the fire approached. And so again, it's in this day and age, the digital age where everybody's sort of in their own little world, literally, um, to have people that are willing to step forward, be leaders in their neighborhoods and organize. Um, it's If it wasn't for uh, these folks behind me, to take uh, that step, organize their neighborhoods. If it wasn't for these two, the first two in the county, now we have hundreds in the county, um, they were the leaders. Um, and so again, I, I can't say enough about what they have done. And so again, to, to organize, to get people to come out of their homes, to do the hard work that it takes um, to prepare their homes, to make their neighborhoods safe, and to make sure that everybody is prepared. I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you guys do. It's well-deserved, and um, I just want to say congratulations. So, here, here. If any of you would like to speak, I definitely want to turn the mic over. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, on behalf of these two FireWise groups, we're delighted to be here, and we really appreciate the Fire Department for the support they've given us over the last six years that we've done this project. Um, we've realized organizing community members is very difficult. We need more FireWise groups in the city. We have a lot of gulches that are very vulnerable, and that's a joint concern of us. 
we're trying to partner a lot with uh, city agencies to um, make sure police and homeless and parks are all on board with what, what we want. And um, we're very grateful for the partnership we've had for six years with the fire department and with Highland Firewise. So thank you all for supporting us. Thank you, Abby. Thank you all. So good to see you. Thank you very much. If we I are. may. Oh, please, please. Thank you. I'm Angela Stanford. I represent the Highland Firewise Group. We've partnered with uh, many different people in the community over the years, but I cannot tell you how amazing it's been to be linked communication-wise with the fire department. Huge, huge thank you to Chief Odie and 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 and. Now you're not you're not acting. No, I'm not acting. Your division, <laughs> division shields. Um, they have made it possible for us to feel like we have some empowerment mm -hmm. as far as allowing the community to be or play a role in fire as well as other safety goals that we have for our communities. And I do want to just ask the city council, other people, to think about how these different groups can work together on a more frequent basis and really help each other, whether that means coming up with programs or just being a resource that you can combine ideas with to get things moving in a more quick fashion because unfortunately I think things are working against us a little bit more than we have time and energy to conquer right now. So if you come to us with any ideas or you want to see us doing anything, we are so receptive to that. But we really need all of the agencies to work together, uh, city parks and recreation. I, I know that these guys have a lot of things in the works, but it would be really, really phenomenal to get the communities more involved in those programs as well. Um, homeless encampments are a big scare. We know that's a much larger problem to tackle than one thing, but in WUI environments, those are on number one priority for us right now. So thinking about those things moving forward and helping us to allow our community to help you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Good to see you. Hello, I'm Laura Caldwell. I'm on the Prospect Heights Firewise Council. And uh, we would like to invite you to come on May 15th with um, uh, Supervisor uh, Manu Koenig's office. We're hosting a town hall uh, meeting on fire safety. And that, and that will be uh, from 6 to 7.30, is that right? At De La Viega Elementary School. And I'd just really like to say that De La Viega School has been so cooperative with us with events we've held, like the, the annual dumpsters. <laughs> um, they're, they're a wonderful partner to work with, too, the school district. So thank you very much for honoring us today. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. We're on item four. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring May 2024 as Affordable Housing Month. Councilmember Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. It's my pleasure to read from this proclamation today. Um, so, and I'll, I'll read some some selections and uh, welcome up our our economic development, housing, and community development housing team. Wonderful to see you all. Um, so, whereas quality affordable housing is vital to healthy, safe, vibrant, and diverse communities, a fact that continues to be highlighted by the presidential declaration of the winter storm disaster, and whereas access to a stable, healthy, affordable home is necessary to take critical steps to preserve individual and public health, whereas affordable homes are critical for the solution to homelessness, um, and to provide support to seniors, families, youth, veterans, people recovering from illness, and people with disabilities. And whereas rising housing costs have led longtime residents to be displaced, lived in, live in overcrowded and substandard homes, or become homeless, 
and whereas creating new permanently affordable homes and preserving and improving existing housing makes for stable, vibrant communities, helping residents maintain community roots and fostering racial and economic diversity for generations, and whereas the city of Santa Cruz has prioritized the creation of housing and has rece received the distinguished pro-housing designation by the state of California, uh, and whereas the city of Santa Cruz currently has four 100% affordable housing projects in development, which will result in the creation of almost 400 units of affordable housing in the community. Now, therefore, I, Councilmember Brown, on behalf of Mayor Keeley and the council, uh, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2024 as Affordable Housing Month in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and along with other leaders in the greater San Francisco and Monterey Bay area regions. So join me in thanking our affordable housing team. Thank you. Ms. Lipscomb, good afternoon and congratulations. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Councilmember Brown, Mayor, and members of the of the council. Um, it's it's really my you know great privilege today to speak on behalf of our housing team. But first, I just want to sort of call them out again and thank you for acknowledging them. So Jessica, Emily, Andrea, and Jess are our very small but mighty housing team. Day in day out, work on our housing programs, housing creation and um, have worked really hard on a couple things up on your screen today. Uh, there are uh, affordable housing activities all throughout the month of May. There's over 23 activities. There are four of those that we're sponsoring specifically in the city, including bringing back um, our very popular uh, Housing Finance 101, which is our partner with Chuck DePew, formerly of National Development Council, now Grow America. Um, and that will both be um, a live Zoom event, and then uh, you can watch it all month long. Um, and then, um, not but least, uh, we're really excited about is for our groundbreaking for PAC Station North, which will be on May 20th at 12 o'clock at PAC Station. And so that's going to be a super exciting event, very long in the making, and our team has worked really hard to get us to this point. So. We're really excited about that as well. And then um, the other thing to mention is just we've had a number of inquiries about the leasing of our city projects and the PAC Station North is open for leasing now. Information is up to date on our city website, both on the main city page and then also on our housing page. So if you have any in, in, you know information, um, interest or questions about uh, rent and income limits, that's all on our website and contact information is there as well. So on behalf of our housing team, thank you very much. Affordable housing, particularly in the city of Santa Cruz, is so critical to our community. So thank you for this proclamation. Thank you. We're on item five. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring May 5th through May 11th as Professional Municipal Clerks Week. Ms. Kalantar Johnson is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to read parts of this proclamation. <clears throat> Whereas the Office of the Municipal Clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government, exists throughout the world. And whereas the Office of Municipal Clerk is the oldest among public servants and serves the mayor, the city council, the city manager, and all administrative departments without exception. And whereas the Office of Municipal Clerk provides the professional link between the citizens, the local government bodies, and agencies of government at other levels, and serves as the information center on functions of local governments and community. And whereas the Municipal Clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all, I, Shepard Kalantari Johnson, on behalf of our mayor, Fred Keeley, do hereby proclaim the week of May 5th through 11th, 2024 as Professional Municipal Clerks Week in the City of Santa Cruz in recognition of the exemplary dedication to public service and extend appreciation to our city clerk, Bonnie Bush, Deputy City Clerk, Julia Wood, and the staff of the City of Santa Cruz City Clerk's Office. Thank you for all your amazing work. Ms. 
Ms. Bush? <laughs> no, thank you. But I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're right. Person of few words and many good deeds. Thank you for everything you and Ms. Wood and your entire team do. Thank you, Bonnie, very, very much. We're on presiding officer announcements. I have none. State, excuse me, I'm sorry. Please proceed. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly mention that um, I last week I attended the Oral Health Summit for Santa Cruz County, and um, there's some amazing work that's being done, especially to increase oral health access and education for seniors. And there are four goals that it's a, a collaboration of different groups. So they're working to collaborate with schools. Um, and working to expand outreach beyond clinic walls and advancing the workforce with hygiene scholarships, dental assistant apprenticeship programs, residency programs, very informational, um, and there's more information online. Um, and then I also wanted to give a quick thank you um, to the city manager and um, to our city staff because May is not only Affordable Housing Month, but also Mental Health Awareness Month. And our HR team and um, uh, sent out a calendar for city employees. And I just want to call that out because since I started on council, we've made a lot of little strides internally. And I think this is huge to be able to offer um, daily I mean, there's something every day during the month of May, daily wellness resources throughout the month for our city employees. Um, and I think that's really important no matter what department they work in. So um, thank you for um, to the city manager and everybody involved in making this happen. And then lastly, um, this Friday at 10 a.m. is I just want the whole community to know there is a push-in ceremony at fire station number two, which is 1103 Soquel Avenue. And um, it's really special because when I first started campaigning in 2020, um, I met with firefighters and we um, really worked hard to address one of the engines that was continually having um, mechanical issues and breakdowns, and that's something we can't have as a public safety response. And so it took a lot of work, a lot of budgeting, and then a lot of waiting for a back-ordered back engine. It's here, the community's invited, um, it has evolved and updated features, and um, I invite everyone to join me and the other council members and mayor that will be there um, to learn more and see this new engine and help push it into the fire station and just know that um, the, the emergency response um, will be improved because of this engine. So I just wanted everyone to know. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We're on statements of disqualification. Any additional statements of disqualification? Council Member Colin Tower Johnson is recognized. Thank you. I jumped the gun earlier. I will be recusing myself from item um, consent item 17, 17. Uh, which is the contract with Ecology Action. I do consulting work with Ecology Action. It's a source of income. So per FPPC regulations, I will be recusing myself. Thank you, Council Member. We're on additions and deletions. We took that up on item 29, but I want to make sure if there are additional additions and deletions. Are there any, Mr. City Attorney? Madam City Clerk, no. thank you. We're on City Attorney closed session report. Mr. City Attorney. Good afternoon, Good Mayor afternoon. Keeley, members of the City Council. Um, this afternoon at 1 p.m., the Council met in closed session in the courtyard conference room to consider two closed session items. The first was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Those are the claims of Allstate Insurance Company and Sean M. Bergman. Those are also listed this afternoon on your consent calendar for action as uh, agenda item 14. The second item was real property negotiations involving property uh, composed of eight 0.15 acres located on Mount Hermon Road in the city of Scotts Valley, commonly known as the Sky Park property. Negotiating part, 
parties are the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Scotts Valley. That is also listed this afternoon on your open session agenda for uh, potential council action as agenda item number 28. And there was no reportable action from the Thank closed you. session. Thank you, sir. Uh, council meeting calendar. Uh, Ms. City Clerk, is there anything you want to draw to our attention? No more, no changes, no. Thank you. We are on the consent agenda. This is item 7 through 22, which we will take up on one motion. What we will do is give an opportunity to council members to uh, pull, comment, or ask questions. We will go to you to give you that opportunity as well. I'm going to start with the vice mayor who has an appointment here in a few minutes, so I'm going to go a little bit out of order and ask Unlike the Unlike this body, I already scheduled my appointments around the Jewish calendar, so I have open house tonight, and I have something I have to go to in five minutes back. Uh, Fair enough. Back there, but I have one, um, I do have one uh, comment regarding, or question on 21. Please proceed. And so I see uh, Director Nguyen back there, and, and I just ho was hoping to clarify for members of the public um, I know there was a lot of questions that we received about the length, width, height of the proposed Bethany culvert and bridge um, as it was published and how it is different from what has been there for decades. I don't know how many. Thank you. Good afternoon. Kevin Crossley, uh, city engineer. Happy to answer questions. Um, so we'll start with uh, just a summary of the changes that have occurred over the last six months. We, we brought this project to you in August of last year. And at that time, we had draft design documents. Um, our, our hope was to use those as a basis for seeking proposals and launching straight into construction. Uh, concurrently, we were working on the infill project. Uh, we had a failed bid uh, experience with uh, draft design drawings for that project, which uh, gave us pause to take the same approach for the Bethany culvert work. We focused on the walls um, and went back and continued to work on design of Bethany culvert. So there was a lot of work and uh, evolution of the design from 30 to what you have now in front of you, which is the 100% design. Quick summary of some of the things that are the same, some that are different. Um, the uh, width of the roadway uh, shown to you in August was proposed to be widened by about six feet. Um, uh, after that, we consulted with Coastal Commission staff, uh, got more into some of the right-of-way issues that were associated with the project and concluded that uh, encroaching seaward, which was part of that uh, August design, was a non-starter for uh, Coastal Commission staff to provide an emergency permit, which we now have in hand. Uh, and uh, as we dug into right-of-way issues on the north side of the project, we uh, concluded that we were, our 30% design actually was uh, spilling over onto private property to the north, uh, which uh, put our emergency funding at jeopardy because they don't uh, allow for you to take right-of-way or change property limits as part of their emergency program that uh, we're seeking funding through. So that's uh, trying to explain the width. Uh, the design you have in front of you still does widen the roadway uh, by a more modest amount of a couple of feet rather than five. Um, so we've done what we think we can within the constraints of the permit uh, environment we're operating in and emergency funding sources that we're utilizing uh, to hopefully build this project. Um, some of the other things that are the same, there's still two sidewalks. We're slightly widening the, um, the south side uh, Pedet mixed youth path, so that's going to uh, be widened out to 10 feet, which we think is a, an improvement to the current conditions. And uh, we're also um, uh, lengthening the amount of seawall compared to the August design, so that's going to provide a much more resilient long term fix to that area. Uh, the height is uh, the same basically as what was proposed in August. So uh, we attempted to elevate the roadway to the extent we could. Um, it's the low point in the road, so uh, at some point you can't make it any taller without basically flattening it out, which changed the drainage dynamics in the area. So that was something that was a fairly fixed constraint, both from August to current. So I just, just one clarification. So just width and height compared to what, what was there prior to the storm to now, because that was, I think, what Nathan said to me, and it made it seem like what's before us is better than what we had before the storm. That's an accurate summary, yes. It's, it's being widened by about two feet. And raised by? By about one foot. Thank you. That's what I wanted everybody to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Further on the consent agenda, Madam Vice Mayor? No, I'm, Thank, a, I'm a yes on it. Very best. Very best to you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, I'm going to start on my left with Council Member Bruner, and I will move this way, Council Member Bruner, on the consent agenda. I had a comment on um, item 16. Please go ahead and make that. Um, item 16 is uh, pitching countywide cleanup day, um, and it's a motion to adopt a resolution declaring the second Saturday of May every year as Santa Cruz County Cleanup Day. And this was an item brought forward, um, and Public Works um, uh, is signed off on it. But I just wanted to call out for the community that um, in Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz, um, we have a lot of resources for illegal dumping, and that even includes putting free items out on the sidewalk. Um, so um, I really encourage um, everyone to visit the City of Santa Cruz Public Works resource recovery page to find out how you can help um, be uh, engaged and participate in the proper way of disposing items because they end up in places and environmental um, harm to our city. But this day and this resolution is special because it's the first annual pitch-in day and it will be countywide, all four cities, Scotts Valley, Capitola, City of Santa Cruz and Watsonville, as well as the county, will be participating. So go to Santa, pitch in Santa Cruz org to find out how you can, on May 11th, do your part on your street or somewhere and um, help with environmental stewardship. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember yep. Colantari Johnson is recognized on the consent agenda. Uh, additional question on 21 and then comments on 21, 10, and 9. I went backwards. Go ahead and make those. Thank you. Um, so uh, Vice Mayor Golder asked the questions and asked for the clarifications, but I have just a couple of additional questions if Director Nguyen um, you wouldn't mind. There was some question about what we're proposing and that it would have adverse impacts on traffic flow. If you could speak to that. Um, I think, I think post-construction. And then um, what are the plans during construction? We know that there will be traffic impacts, so what are the plans during construction? And then the last question is, uh, well, yeah, if, if you could explain the nature and process of this of this funding source that we're going after. Yeah, happy to do so. Nathan Nguyen, Director of Public Works. Uh, so with regards to the traffic impacts on the Bethany Culvert project, uh, during construction, uh, you can expect that the culvert itself, the location on Westcliff, is going to be fully closed. So uh, not just to vehicles, but both to pedestrians and bicyclists as well. So there is going to be a detour plan that's included with this project to detour all residents, all members, to uh, Almar, Oxford, and uh, Woodrow. Um, the project itself is expected uh, to take approximately three to six months uh, before the end of, before we hit winter is our goal here. Um, Post-construction, the traffic patterns, uh, we, what we'd hope to see is go back to uh, what it was prior to our 2023 storm events. And so uh, that will be the time when we go from no way to a two way uh, on Westcliff. And so, uh, there's no changes anticipated at this time for that, and we'll bring that back to council. And I think the last question you had... The funding source, funding just the source. nature and sort of the process. Yes, correct. So the funding source that we are uh, going after is called uh, Emergency Opening Through Federal Highway Administration. It's administered through uh, Caltrans, and so uh, we are open to that funding source due to the disaster declarations that were provided both at our level, the state, as well as uh, from the federal government. And so we're processing the funding through that um, funding source right now. And as uh, Assistant Director, City Engineer Kevin mentioned uh, prior, is that the funding source doesn't allow for us to uh, do any type of right-of-way takes in order to implement these emergency restoration projects. Okay, one more quick follow-up to um, the, tra the closures. Um, how, are, how are we communicating with uh, neighbors and adjacent streets? 
So we'll, we'll be using, utilizing our social media as well as our online presence on our website. So we're providing the temporary traffic control plan there. The adjacent neighbors on West Cliff Drive itself, the ones that are impacted directly between the, essentially the, I think it's the 1000 block of West Cliff, uh, I've been contacted and we'll continue to work with them because they'll will have limited access uh, as during the construction. Thank you, those are my questions. And if I may quickly, I'll give some comments. Um, um, yeah, thank you. So item nine is the ocean protection grant. Item 10 is the contract for living shoreline, um, nature-based solution and sand management feasib feasibility study. And of course, item 21 is the Bethany curve on Westcliff. Um, just an acknowledgement and thank you to um, all the different departments and staff that go after these grants and contracts. Um, you know, council and the community, the community has spoken, the council has listened, um, and we've given direction, and for staff to sort of jump on these opportunities so that we can meet those directions and um, meet the ever-changing needs of our coastal zones, um, it's, it's just commendable. Um, so I want to acknowledge you, I want to thank you, and, and I understand that Sometimes we have to move quickly. So transparency, community engagement is always essential, um, and the ability to move quickly so that we can access these resources is also important. So I appreciate the work. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Watkins on the consent agenda. I'll, I'll just be brief. You know, the, the comments made by my colleague on 9 and 10, it was great to see that in there. I think there's a lot. Um, that really highlights our interest in creating a plan, aligning our current plans, and also engaging our community, including our youth leaders, in an equity-centered approach. So I just want to show my appreciation. We have a full consent agenda with a lot of actions, and I um, just wanted to call those out as well. So that's Good, it. Thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized on the consent agenda. Thank you. I would just add here, here <laughs> to my, my uh, colleagues' comments on these items, and thank you, Tiffany. Um, for all of your your efforts, um, especially, so um, and our obviously our public works team on the uh, Bethany culvert. That's a it's a seriously challenging uh, configuration there, and it's amazing that you're um, staying sane as you <laughs> figure it out. Um, but I have a so I have a quick question on uh, item 15, the sidewalk vending enforcement contract. I um. I'm just wondering, we, we had a contractor, that contract ended. Um, it's not essential that I get this question answered before we vote on this, but I'm just curious um, why we didn't, they didn't want to continue with that service, um, if, if, if there's any particular reason. Um, and my general sense is this is a, a contract that we, are pursuing because of the capacity issues in PD and in Parks and Rec, correct? Um, uh, so, I, I, but I'd just love to hear about, it, it was just interesting to me and one contractor in particular ca caught my attention, so just Mr. wondering. Mr. Butler, good afternoon. Thanks. In response to the council member's question. Thank you, Mayor. Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, council member Brown, you may recall when we um, originally had this direction, it was, Kind of this time two years ago, and um, in uh, the uh, in that time frame, we utilized an existing contract to provide those um, those services, and so we had utilized that contract for two years. And um, this being the third season, we went out with an RFP for uh, a new vendor. So this is just a function of the putting it out to bid. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Councilmember Newsom is recognized on the, can, on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. I sure. just want to uh, echo the comments of my colleagues on associate myself with the, their comments on item number 9 and 10. Uh, and I also want to make a quick comment on item number 11 and just want to thank Sustainability and Research Resiliency Officer uh, Dr. Wise West and Assistant uh, City Manager Schmidt for bringing this item forward. Uh, this item will seek to procure $125,000 in grant funding to convert our existing city vehicles fleet from gas fuel to electrical vehicles, which will uh, contribute to us reaching our Climate 2030, uh, Climate Action 2030 goals. So I'm happy to see this on the agenda and, and happy to support it. 
Let me see if there's anyone with us today who wishes to comment on any item on the consent agenda. Let me make sure we're clear on what the rule here is. You can comment on as many items as you want, but you have a total of, of uh, three minutes to do so. Anyone wish to comment on the consent agenda? Good afternoon again. Yeah, hello, my name is still James Ewing. I'd like to comment on 8, 11, 12, and yes, 18, sir. starting with 8. The clerks do have the most important job in the room. They are the historians. I could go on for hours about how challenging their job is, but I appreciate everything they do and how easy it is to sometimes access stuff, usually in this city. Thank you very much. So as far as uh, 11 and 12 and 18, they can kind of be linked together. You know, the city is offering incentives on number 11 for employees to turn in their gas vehicle for an electric. And then number 12, the city is being granted an additional $100,000 to fire to use at their disposal. And number 18 has to do with, what is it, $389,541.00. Ten cents for an installation of a medium and heavy duty um, AC charging system for medium and heavy duty electric vehicles. Now, I I do a lot of research. You know, I know that recently an electric garbage truck in um, New York couldn't even do four hours of work. Or let's say most of those commercial service vehicles, they are serviced every ninety days. What is that, 2,100 hours? Let's say that they're working 50% duty over 1,000 hours. What is that, 250 times more efficient? You know, it's really quite interesting. I might want to comment and stay for the CalPERS or the AB481 or the CORE. Maybe I won't stay. I got another minute. Oh, I've been pretty brief so far. So, you know, anybody could do their own research. You know, just like the World Homicide Organization, the WHO, what is there, 194 nations? There are people that have done the research to add up the particulates that all those countries produce per capita, all 194, just identical to the who, to the who. In reality, natural plate tectonics and volcanism produces 15 times the amount of particulate matter as all humans do in all industries. So these pushes for electronics and replacing things, I mean, hey, electric assist with diesel is great, but you don't see any electric fire trucks. You don't, you gotta wonder why. Because a diesel or a diesel electric is at least 250 times more durable. That's enough for now, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Do we have anyone online who wishes to comment on the consent agenda? What we'll do, sir, is we're going to toggle back and forth. We'll take someone online, then we'll take you, someone online, so on. Let's go to the next person online. Yeah, sure. This is Garrett Phillip. Good afternoon. Uh, yes. Uh, I will address items 9, 10, 11, but uh, for 10 seconds here, I want to briefly first say your judgment as mayor is not in question by denying me my civil right to address the council during oral communications. Funny, you were so patient for those 10 hours of wasted testimony listening to radical Hamas supporters. I can only think you prefer that some people speak, speak well beyond their time, or others less so, or not at all, at your speech discrimination whim. Uh, the emperor will need to explain himself. Anyway, as to item 11, I have a very low opinion as corrupt of a government that would use taxpayer dollars just to line exclusively the pockets of city employees so they can afford what are extremely expensive EV cars, which are normally out of the price range for most all citizens. It's more corruption-based, effective, equity, DEI garbage sold on the climate change grift. What's the difference to just transferring general fund money into pockets in exchange for nothing? The basic state grant purpose is really to increase energy efficiency, and there are hundreds of potentially more legitimate uses with overall community benefit for that money, but no, the staff picked the line their pockets variety. This is getting money for nothing. On item nine, 
Any careful reading of this doesn't even give a hint of what these coastal blueprints might accomplish or what exactly what this multitude of people will be tasked with, who are they, why we need them, for instance, pay for youth and equity advisors, really, who are they and why? Uh, this is, give me the money, I'll tell you later what it's really for, and it was submitted late. So I guess your actual authorization is superfluous, and the really pushy, unelected bureaucrats, uh, they really run this show, don't they? $960,000, wowee, for something this vague. What will the implementation cost be? Who knows? As to item 10. I'm suspicious. This is just another expensive consultant who tells the city what it wants to hear with a very vague performance contract. After looking at the contract, I see the goal is to study compare three undefined so-called nature-based solutions. And I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, I'll bet you 50 bucks they'll come up with anything that's going to work on Westcliff. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon and welcome. Council members, Mayor. Uh, my name is Chris Hosmer. I'm a resident of Westside, Santa Cruz. Um, this is concerning uh, the Bethany Bridge culvert project. Uh, the current revised plans for the Bethany Curve Bridge were only submitted 24 hours ago. I believe there's a rule that you need to submit items to the council packets at least 72 hours before a decision is made on something. The revised plans show the new bridge being five feet narrower than the previous version, which had two five-foot bike lanes each side of the two-lane traffic. Since we're spending $12 million of the government's money on this new bridge, we should build it to accommodate all forms of transportation, cars, bikes, and walkers. Build a bike lane to accommodate the fast bikes and <clears throat> fast bikes and e-bikes and use the existing 10-foot path by the ocean for walkers and slow bikes. Don't let the restrictions on betterment stop us from making a bridge that will accommodate everyone. I recommend that we go back to the drawing board and make a wider bridge by moving inland to provide enough room for bike lanes. I have been told by knowledgeable people that this process is not that difficult. This should appease the biking coalition who want to make the roadway one way. We should not compromise the design of this important piece of the thoroughfare of Westcliff just on a technicality, as this will create a bottleneck on our beautifully restored two-way road. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have another person online. No one online. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Hi. Hi. My name's Anthony Rufo, and um, I want to say, um, first of all, thank you for your guys' work. I know it's hard to please everybody, and thank you guys for listening and, and just appreciate it. Um, I know it's hard work. I was up late night just ah, on the phone and stuff, but um, I guess my only concern is, yeah, it was with, like echoing what he said was the fact that, um, you know, the new plans came up so quick and, but I get it, you know, there, there's, there's process and all that stuff and um, you got the coastal commission and, and you got all these things and hurdles and stuff. So I get it. Um, I guess my concern was with a group of people that, that I'm representing, I guess, would, would be just hoping that the bridge was wide enough to accommodate the bikes as well as the two way rope. because we know, because our thing is, you know, we want to keep the two-way traffic as long as we can. And I know having the bikes incorporated in there somewhere is a big deal. So, you know, that was just our concern, I guess. And um, and I just want to say thanks, you guys, for the work. So hopefully in the future we can keep working together and do, do things proactively instead of the last minute. That's all. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Rufo. Appreciate your testimony. On the consent agenda, sir, please come forward. Welcome. Thank you for addressing Hi, everybody. Um, I, I uh, had a real fun time getting here. Um, okay, it sounds like everybody's talking about the uh, Westcliff stuff that uh, you were talking about last meeting, and I did have something to say about it. Um, Thomas Church, uh, not Thomas Hayden Church, the actor, but Thomas Church, he's a famous uh, landscape designer. Uh, he died in the 70s, but he, he designed UCSC, and a lot of uh, his work uh, made its way to uh, Pacific Avenue, which... Um, a lot of the people who remember it uh, remember it very well, but the earthquake changed things uh, drastically. Um, Westcliff is great, but it could be even better if you guys put some thought in. Like some of these depictions, I, f I feel like the depictions of some of the changes that are made are AI generated, okay? And the problem with that is, is that's like uh, calling a smartphone smart, right? Um, it's not necessarily the case in most instances. So, um, like uh, a, a narrower bike lane, definitely like this enormous bike lane is really absurd. 
Um, and uh, but uh, but definitely egress for bikes in both directions, like like very very considerate of the needs of bicycle riders uh, versus pedestrians, and then integrating the pedestrian zone and the traffic zone with the bicyclists. Bike bicyclists have legal egress into the the lane of traffic, and they and they should, and it should be designed with that in mind. Okay, because sometimes uh, the bicyclist is avoiding, you know, a baby carriage for whatever reason. So. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, Thomas Church's uh, design philosophy was really, really brilliant, and I, I recommend reading about Thomas Church on the internet um, because one of the reasons people are so proud of the natural beauty of UCSE is the integrative architecture and the integrative landscaping of Thomas Church. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone online, Ms. Bush? No one online. Last call on comments on the consent agenda. Matters back before the body. I'll move the consent agenda. Motion and a second. Motion by Ms. Brown, second by Ms. Watkins on the consent agenda for the debate or discussion on this item. You are going to be registered as abstaining on item 17. 17. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Valentary Johnson? Aye. An abstention on 17. Vice Mayor Golder is absent for this, and Mayor Keeley. Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on items 23 through 24 inclusive. These are consent public hearing items. These are consent public hearing items. We will take these all up at, at one time. Members of the public wish to make comment, provide testimony on the public hearing on items 23, 24. This would be your opportunity to do so. Seeing and hearing no one, matter of respect, please come forward, Mr. Ewing. Good afternoon again, sir. Hi, James Ewing, I appreciate the brevity. It's quite spontaneous. Uh, you know, CalPERS 481. No, I wasn't. There. Give me a second. I wasn't expecting these comments. So, just give a minute. Pardon me. Didn't mean to close this. So this is on 23 and 24? Yes, sir. You know what? I'm just going to wait. It's not going to make any difference anyway. Okay. Thanks. No, 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 no. I don't need to comment on it. I thought I Very did. Good. In the in this, Let's do the brevity. Maybe we can all get out of here quickly. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Anyone online? Matters back before the body. Public hearing is closed. Motion would be in order. Sure. I'll move consent, public hearing, items 23 and 24, noting 23 is going to be um, continued. Motion by Council Member Watkins, second by Ms. Bruner. <laughs> Further debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none, the clerk. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Valentary Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent, and Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and it's awarded. We are on item 25. This is a receipt of the annual report on AB 481, annual military equipment report, as required in our city code. Chief, good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor. Uh, Bernie Escalante, Chief of Police. Uh, I'm going to introduce Sergeant Josh Trog, who will give a brief presentation on our AB 481 required present annual presentation and then we can open it up for questions uh, when good. he's done. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon and welcome. Wherever you would like.
Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, afternoon Ms. Mayor. Brothers, welcome. Council members, sir. Uh, Sergeant Josh Frog, Police Department, to uh, provide the annual report for our uh, military equipment uh, list. Nice. So just a little bit of a recap on uh, what AB 41 requires. Our policy as approved by uh, the governing body, the council, our reporting requirements, uh, which we have to report on annually. Uh, and that uh, AB 41 requires the council reauthorize annually the uh, military equipment list. And noting that uh, this process establishes safeguards for uh, the public uh, and for the police department in, in use of this equipment. Uh, just to give a brief overview to remind everyone what the uh, categories are, what they encompass. So category one uh, encompasses uh, robots and unmanned aerial vehicles. So currently uh, we have the recon robots uh, and we have uh, approval for the acquisition of unmanned aerial vehicles, which is in process. Uh, our command and control vehicles under category five, uh, categories two and three uh, are armored personnel carrier and the uh, attachments that it has uh, require it to fall under those categories. Transport vehicles uh, for our, uh, the, the uh, Ford transport vehicle that we have uh, falls under category five, specialized firearms and ammunition less than 50 caliber, category 10, uh, specialized uh, firearms and ammunition greater than 50 caliber, which encompasses our breaching shotguns and our uh, chemical agent launching shotgun, falls under category eight and nine. And then, uh, Category 12, flashbang, tear gas, pepper balls, uh, which we have. Uh, category 14 is our 40 millimeter less lethal launchers and associated ammunition. Category 13 is our long range acoustic device. And then category 15 is all other specialized equi equipment, which we, in our case uh, covers the uh, patrol rifles, the AR-15 style patrol rifles that we have. So as uh, this graph shows, uh, it's color coordinated to denote how the equipment was used uh, in each category, uh, with green being in the field, uh, the light blue is a presentation, uh, brown color is training, green is uh, an assist other department, uh, the dark maroon color is uh, refueling, and then yellow is maintenance. Uh, so the bulk of uh, what was used for the robot is training. Uh, we did use the sheriff's office uh, UAVs during the reporting period. Uh, the armored personnel carrier uh, accounted for multiple uses across the uh, reporting criteria. Uh, training uh, for firearms and flashbang tear gas and pepper balls. Uh, the 40 millimeter uh, less lethal launchers used uh, extensively in the field, which is where they are in the patrol vehicles. Uh, they were, and in training, and then uh, the uh, patrol rifles also. The breakdown of how the uh, armored personnel carrier was used during the reporting period. So went for maintenance. Uh, we assisted Watsonville PD, uh, some training and demonstrations obviously refueling. Uh, it was uh, taken to our officer-involved shooting incident, and then we assisted the sheriff's department twice with the ARV. The breakdown of the costs, uh, you'll see that uh, the bulk of what uh, the, the costs associated with this equipment are training. Um, the most of the, a lot of the training 
revolves around the patrol rifles because there's a lot of post-mandated training that is associated with those uh, that we have to stay current on. Um, the Some of the other costs associated are, are just purchase costs uh, for uh, replenishing ammunition, uh, replenishing uh, other consumables, and then maintenance, and then uh, the, obviously the the purchase of the new throwbot that we received authorization for is listed in the cost for the throwbot. And then our intended acquisition. So we already received uh, council approval to uh, purchase the unmanned aerial uh, systems, the drones, and that is progressing. Uh, hopefully, we will take possession of those in the not too distant future. So on April 3rd, we held our uh, community engagement uh, meeting for AB 41 uh, via Zoom, I presented this report. Um, we fielded multiple questions. Uh, we have listed uh, five of the questions here that uh, were, were brought up. I'm happy to uh, expound upon any of those questions if, if uh, that is desired. And then I would like to note that this QR code in the bottom right-hand corner of the presentation is a direct link to our transparency portal that has all of the documentation uh, that can be used. That is the end of the presentation. Let me see if there are questions from council members on the presentation. Ms. Brown is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I thank you for the presentation. I appreciate hearing that the community meeting happened prior to our approval uh, this time around. I've been advocating for that. Um, and it was interesting to see the questions. Uh, just wondering, and I don't want to ask you to answer them all right here, but just um, curious about how, the extent to which those questions were discussed and answered at the community meeting. I didn't attend myself. Um, did, did people get responses, or is there some plan to make that information available uh, we answered otherwise? The, we answered the, the technical questions in detail. There were several questions that were related to a kind of general questions about our Axon body camera system that weren't exactly pertinent to the core of the AB41 thing. Um, so I would say that I, I don't know if we answered those to the satisfaction of the asker, but they weren't really in the vein of what we were talking about, and that specifically doesn't fall under AB481. Uh, the technical questions that were listed in there, we did answer in detail uh, and provided the feedback uh, that we believe was solicited in those questions. Thank you. For the questions and comments, Ms. Bruner is recognized. Thank you for those, um, the report and the updates and the information. Um, and uh, it was really helpful, I'll echo, to see the questions from the community engagement. And um, um, I'm wondering if any questions uh, that were not part of what this was pertinent to, um, if there, if everybody who attended knows how to seek those answers or were given direction to, or is there an FAQ site that we need to maybe add some of those answers to our transparency portal, at Santa Cruz Police web website, or I just, I just strive for transparency and having those ans those questions answered and and making sure that um, if there are concerns from community members that they're addressed and that council is aware of anything and um, perhaps Chief uh, Escalante could speak to yeah. that. Thank you. Um, I do recall one question was related to security concerns uh, regarding a recent topic of the ALPRs. Mm -hmm. And again, it was not germane to the topic of and why we were there. Uh, and we also have had that question asked and answered with the uh, ALPR representative providing details that we couldn't necessarily provide to the security of their system. So... Um, my suggestion would be is that we have a comment 
uh, community comment form. And if somebody would like to ask those sort of questions uh, online, they can access that form. And those, those questions come to myself as well as our independent auditor. That's great for any future community engagement meetings. And just for everybody, um, ALPR is automatic license plate reader, if you didn't know. Thank you. For the questions or comments on the item, motion would be in order. Excuse me. Anyone wish to testify on this item? Let's go, Mr. Young. Let's go pick up the pace here. Thank you. So I really appreciate the efficiency as far as the AB 481. The question that I have and I wish I would have taken notes on, I can be, I'm just going to call it out. It was my understanding that some um, bullets were being described that were different than the U.S. military and they use full metal jackets for two reasons. They're more accurate and they're less likely to blow the person away. Uh, so I'd like clarification on that. You know, I would have taken a picture of the one vehicle pictured, which seemed to have a a wench that was, the material was chain. That's quite interesting. I'm sure it's in the parking lot if it's there. But to talk about the elephants in the room that are really affecting everything, and that's why I showed up here about five years ago. Specifically, this is item 25, page 10. And... You know, different, okay, under 705 policy military equipment, 705.1.1, government code 7070. There's maybe 15 different areas on that. The two that I would like to make note of are weaponized aircraft or vehicles of any type. Boy, maybe we'll see some electrogravitics in this city. Um, and then taser, shockwave, microwave weapons, water cannons, and long-range acoustical devices. No, I know because a friend of mine was a police dispatcher for 45 years that they have sound attenuating equipment where, you know, in the county, somebody fires a gun, they can decide, they can determine whether it was from the front yard or backyard. So the real weapons are the silent ones. So um, all around here, due to 1996, 704, 702, the policy from the FCC, the only complaint people can make is, how these frequency military weapons in civilian locations look. Now, I don't know why the other citizens have swallowed their whatever and not put a fight to that, because you guys are concerned about your stakeholders, and the citizens are being greatly affected. There have been hundreds of people who have provided testimony as to different types of frequency weapons. So again, my question is, I'm hoping that the bullets that the all law enforcement in the United States are full metal jacket because they're more accurate and they're less likely to kill the person. When I kill the person, you just shoot accurately. Anyway, um, rear weapons are the silent ones. So I'll be brief. That was great. I appreciate this. And wow, what a quick meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Anyone else wish to testify on this item? Do we have anyone online? We'll take the person online. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Peter Gelblum. I have three uh, issues I'd like to discuss, and I did raise um, uh, at least two of these at the community meeting, but did not get satisfactory responses. As the uh, summary sheet tells you, as part of your annual review that you should be conducting right now, one of the things you must determine is whether the use in the prior year of each piece of equipment has complied with the use policy that you previously approved. It's obviously impossible to make that determination if the authorized uses in the use policy are so broadly defined as to effectively place no limits on the use so that any use is permitted. You can't then determine responsibly whether a uh, particular use complied with the use policy. And for at least six weapons, uh, that's the case here. The authorized use policy uses language that the uses include but are not limited to the following uses. Well, if there's no limit, then you can't determine whether it's complied with the use, or in other words, every use will comply with the authorized use. And that's obviously not the goal of the statute. 
with six weapons, and these are the paragraph numbers where this language appears in the AB-41 equipment list, which is the attachment to Exhibit A in your packet. Drones in paragraph 2C, flashbangs in paragraph 10C, tear gas in paragraph 11B, 40 millimeter projectiles in paragraph 15C, and pepper balls and pepper ball guns in paragraph 12B. So I urge you to talk to your counsel and uh, the SCPD and try to get them to remove that language so that you can effectively determine whether a use has complied with an authorized use. Otherwise, you can't fulfill your responsibility under the statute. Second, the annual report, uh, page 21, footnote 9, uh, admits that the SCPD did not track firearm usage by firearm type in 2023, something that's something they're required to do by AB 41. So I would urge you to uh, ask why and to make sure to order that the SCPD do that in 2024, that they track firearm usage by firearm type. And finally, I appreciate the further detail on Category 15, the assault rifles. That's something we had asked for, but been refused earlier, but I see it's been done now. My question is, the resolution says that will be incorporated into the ordinance when it is next amended. Why wouldn't it be incorporated into the ordinance today? That's my question, and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Sergeant, did you pick up that last question or so from... Yes, sir. Would you be willing to respond to that, sir? Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh, with relation to the firearm tracking, uh, issue so i have to kind of explain a little bit it's not that we don't track firearm usage in that if we had an incident where a firearm was used in a lethal force scenario we wouldn't know what that was we factually do that what it's in reference to is uh we we construe tr use to mean display training uh anytime uh one of these devices is uh, specifically like the 40 mil launchers, the rifles, or handguns are displayed in the field, we want to track that, irrespective of if it's been fired, if that makes sense. Yeah. So our current tracking for these uses of force, which is what they are and how we track them, didn't differentiate between rifles and handguns. It captured all firearms inclusive. AB 41 does require us to parse that out, we are working through our internal processes to create a way that we can do that very accurately and very smoothly for all of the officers uh, and uh, entities within the department that have control over providing this data to council. So we are doing it. It just does take some time to get all of that process in place. Thank you, sir. Matters back before the body. Anyone else online? Matters back before the body, a motion would be in order. The vice mayor's moving the staff recommendation. Ms. Comtar Johnson seconds. You may open on your motion. Um, thank you for the transparent process. I appreciate all the good work that the men and women at the police department do to provide um, public safety to our community. That's all I have to say. Thank you. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. I, I just have uh, a quick comment. I, I want to say thank you to SCPD for, um, you know, I think very um, diligently and um, meaningfully working on the 481 policy um, for us and um, for our community. And, you know, appreciate your uh, willingness to answer questions, you know, be transparent and to set up systems that allow the public to have access to this information. Uh, that said, I'm, I'm going to say this is mostly for my colleagues here. Um, I'm not going to be able to support the motion. Um, I have tried in the past to uh, get support for putting some guardrails on the um, including but not limited to language. This has come up every year that this has been on our agenda. And um, and I have the same analysis as Mr. Gelbloom that by uh, including that without any um, real, uh, again, guardrails, I'll just say, uh, that, that it is very difficult for us to make any determination about the appropriateness of use. In reviewing what we have here, it seems to me um, that it has been appropriate. However, um, I'm concerned about the, the policy so uh, and the fact that, that we just 
really don't have a way to say <laughs> you know much about that um, if without with the uh, kind of unlimited uh, uses. So I, I just wanted to share that it's uh, not about um, you know the work the work that y'all are doing. Um, I, I still feel that that's important, and I I hope that um, in the future that's something that councils will consider. But I won't try again today. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Further debate or discussion, Ms. Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious about any response from PD on that language, and I'm wondering if it can maybe an appropriate place would be at the Public Safety Committee at a future date um, just to bring that um, work through. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, we've had a lot, I've had a lot of conversation with the independent auditor on that particular phrase. Um, the real concern is locking us into a particular scenario that's not able to be captured in one single policy. And the concern is as soon as we're faced with a scenario where the use of the equipment is appropriate and it's legal, but it is not captured specifically in that policy, then we're outside of policy. There's just no way to capture all of the uses. I feel that the report out here annually shows all the uses and there's several layers of review to ensure that the uses are within the law and within the policy. As an example, we had a use of our armored vehicle a couple years ago. That conversation was brought forward. The independent auditor reviewed the use, reviewed our policy, and notified the community member. Their opinion was that it was within policy. So there's a process. There's layers of review. But um, long answer, but the short part is there's no way to capture all the possible scenarios. And, and that's my concern about removing that, that phrase. Thank you for that and that response. Further debate or discussion, seeing here none, clerk will call. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? Aye. Brunner? Aye. Valentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? All right. Motion passes this order. For those that may be uh, watching this online, I want to uh, uh, reiterate that earlier today the City Council has extended and continued item 29 by re-referral of the item to the Santa Cruz City Planning Commission. And uh, uh, we will be uh, hearing that item after it comes back to us from the City Council at a later date. So anyone who is planning on testifying on item 29, this relates to the food bin project. Uh, this item is, uh, is continued and is referred to the Planning Commission. We, uh, without objection, we will take a 10 minute, actually a nine and a half minute break until 20 after three. The hour 420, excuse me, 322, having arrived, the council is back in regular session following a brief afternoon recess. We are on item number 29. This is an item relating, excuse me, relating to Delaware edition. There's a staff presentation. Ms. Shaw, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Um, good afternoon, uh, council members. My name is Rena Zo, and I am the planner for the Delaware Edition Plan Development Project. Let me do a couple of things. One is, first of all, let me apologize for mispronouncing your name. I apologize. You have a very soft voice. Make sure you speak directly into the microphone so we can all hear you. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Rena Zo, and I am the planner for the Delaware Edition Plan Development Project. This project was approved in 2008, and a development agreement was entered into between the city and the owner, which helps to minimize any uncertainties for complex and long-term projects such as this. 
As part of the development agreement, the owner submits an annual compliance report to staff for review to, de to determine whether or not the owner is in substantial compliance with the terms of the agreement, including the project approvals. This process allows for staff to bring any questions to council at a public hearing uh, if there are any disagreements that come up between the, uh, the owner and staff, or in this case, if there's any uncertainties or if we're seeking any clarifications. We wanted to bring these clarifications uh, to council to provide a transparent process for the community. And so I'll touch upon some of these uh, clarification questions later on in this presentation. So today we will be discussing um, leasing lot 20 and 21, which is highlighted on the approved master site plan for the Delaware edition uh, shown on this slide uh, to UCSE. Lot 20, at uh, the residential buildings on lot 20 will be used for student housing and on lot 21 will be used for uh, UC staff and faculty housing. So the first question um, that came up is whether or not leasing the buildings to UCSC would make these buildings considered an educational facility. And after researching the education code and the municipal code, uh, we believe that leasing the buildings to UCSC would not make them an educational facility because when we review uses, we typically look at our municipal code definitions. And so the municipal code definition for educational use, which we see as synonymous with educational facility, does not mention housing. There is an argument uh, that could be made that the use could be considered an educational facility and that more information about that is also uh, provided in the staff report. Um, but the main gist of that is basically surrounding state law definitions of educational facility and dormitory, which again, we don't typically look at. We mainly focus on the municipal code definitions. Uh, the second uh, discussion point is regarding a condition of approval uh, that requires the owner's association to provide early notification um, of any available residential units to onsite employees before offering them to the general public. And in this case, we see the general public as anyone who is not an on-site employee. Uh, the owner believes that they're consistent with this condition of approval because they are not offering the units to the public. They are master leasing these buildings to uh, UC directly. Uh, and so they believe that this condition of approval is not applicable. Um, while we think that they do need to meet this condition. So uh, we agree with some of their clarify, uh, sorry, with some of their um, reasoning related to sustainability aspect of housing students, staff, and faculty at this location. Uh, people living here uh, at this site would still be living close to where they work and where they study, and so that still meets the project approvals. And because of that, um, staff believe that we can clarify this condition of approval and have the owner deviate from having to provide um, early notification to on-site employees through an operating memorandum process. And this operating memorandum process is, um, is noted in the development agreement and is a way for uh, the owner to provide, um, it's a way for us to provide clarifications or any minor modifications to uh, the project. So with the affordable housing components, um, the university is requesting to consolidate uh, the required seven low income units onto lot 21, which will be used for workforce housing instead of lot 20 and 21. And they are also proposing to provide an additional 12 units to moderate income households on lot 21, as long as the units will be used for workforce housing. The owner has specified that um, they will not enter into the lease with UC unless UC commits to providing the workforce housing initially. And this is a matter that council will need to weigh in on. So the, to recap our recommended process, um, we believe that the use is not an educational facility, that the owner needs to meet the condition of approval unless it is clarified. Um, and the recommended process is to process an operating memorandum to clarify the conditions, um, the affordable housing components, in order for the owner to move forward with recording the proposed amendments to the CCNRs and the revised affordable housing agreements. Um, aside from the affordable housing matter that council needs to weigh in on. Thank you.
Thank you. Is that the extent of the presentation by staff? Thank you very much. Questions or comments by staff, by uh, council members? Vice Mayor is recognized. I do have some comments, and I just want to say, um, as opposed to the previous development that we were speaking about um, this afternoon, I really appreciate the owner and the developer's attention to detail and willing to work with us. Um, and I know there's been several iterations. I know it's a deviation. I've been talking with Councilmember Watkins from what was originally proposed. However, I think that this meets the needs of our community in, in having um, off-campus student housing. I think. Um, having the workforce housing is a very welcomed and appreciated addition to, and component to the project. I appreciate the scale of the project and um, everything about it, and it's in my district, and I am really happy with this, um, with this collaboration between the university, the city, the owner developers, and everybody. So I'm so pleased to support this project this afternoon, so thank you. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Collintar Johnson. I just want to echo these comments as well that um, this is much needed um, additional affordable housing units. So very much appreciate that. Um, it's much needed workforce housing. And as Vice Mayor Golder said, um, housing for students needs to happen on campus and it needs to happen throughout our community. So um, yeah, I, I, I think it'll be an activation of the space and we've been long waiting for that. And so I'm looking forward to having a completed project. And I will be supporting this as well. Very good. Councilmember Brown is recognized. So, uh, just, just clarifying here. Um, I thought we were on questions, um, but I'm, if we this are. is my opportunity, okay, we so we're on questions. So I'll wait for my comments. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Certainly, Councilmember Watkins is recognized. <laughs> Till the way. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I'll save my comments for after as well. But in terms of where your presentation ended in terms of direction for the affordable housing component, do you want to say more about what you're looking for? Sure. Um, so I think what we're looking for uh, is just for council to weigh in on the fact that the 12 additional units are tied to, um, are tied to workforce housing specifically. Um, and they're not really, they're not being provided in perpetuity. And so it's just getting your thoughts on that and how you guys feel about that. Uh, but the owner has said that they're, they've are they committed to not signing the lease unless you see agrees to provide the workforce housing initially. And so at least you know for sure that for the start, it, there will be workforce housing and the additional 12 units will be provided. It's just a matter of how long they'll be there for. You have the floor. I, ha I do have a follow-up question there. Thank you. Um, and can you remind us what the, that threshold is at 120% of market? What what the rents would, you know, what that what that means? Who it would be affordable to? Good evening, Council Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. I need just a moment to look that up, and I can get you a better answer. The the uh, median income for a family of four is roughly 132,000, um, but the tables don't follow a strict um, percentage. So 120% doesn't mean that it's 132 plus 20%. So if you give me a moment, I'll, I'll look that up. And um, what it does is it um, gives a, uh, a typically 30% of your income is what is dedicated towards uh, um, that um, rental amount. Um, so one moment, I'll look up the table. <laughs> Thank you. And, and actually, uh, Mr. Butler, I don't need the exact number, but I just, this is really for the public to understand. We're talking about, you know, I'm not going to thank uh, a developer for units available or, or the operator for units available to people earning well over $130,000 a year. Calling that affordable to me just doesn't make any sense. So I just wanted to make that clear. You don't have to give me the exact number. I, I could, I've got the tables. Thank you. Uh, thanks. And, and I would just point out, um, the, there are different categories um, of affordability. And so 50% and lower, 30% well, and lower is extremely low. 50% and lower is very low. Um, 50 to 80 is low. And then 80 to 120% is considered moderate. And so there, they as as a hundred and twenty percent, we would be hitting that um, that target. And your comments are accurate. 
it's you know some some amount above the one hundred thirty-two thousand for a family of four. Councilmember Watkins is recognized. I just want to make sure I, I understood clearly. If I heard you correctly, you said that they um, wouldn't agree to partner with the university if or sign the lease if they didn't agree to the affordable units. Is that accurate? Uh, it's if they don't agree to providing the workforce housing initially. Like we want to make sure that the workforce housing component is part of this project. <laughs> and so um, the 12 moderate income units are tied to as long as the workforce housing is there. So at least for the foreseeable future, they will be providing an additional 12 units tied to the workforce housing. And you're suggesting that would go into the memorandum of understanding in terms of compliance or accountability to that statement of that's what they promised to do. Into the operating memorandum. Operating memorandum. Okay. Thank you. For the questions or for the questions or to the let me see if there's anyone with us who wishes to make comment on this item. This would be your opportunity to do so. Anyone online? Matters back before the body. Motion would be in order. Let me, before there is a motion, could I ask one question? Uh, Mr. Gandotti uh, and Mr. Butler, uh, I am, there is a recommendation here on page 26.1 on this item. That is the recommendation. Are you seeking additional action on this item? I'm reviewing the um, recommendation right Take now. Take a moment, sure. please you. do. Yes. The only thing that I would say in quickly looking at this is um, the council could, should they choose to do so, um, uh, memorialize the um, owner's um, intent to um, rent this um, for the initial purpose of UC providing workforce housing. And so um, that um, was um, part of what we had understood and, and that is also part of the intent of what the applicant has indicated. Um, I, um, I think that the documents likely you know, are um, okay in speaking to that, but but given these additional conversations that we've had today, I don't think it would be um, bad if the council, in addition to the um, recommendation at hand, also specified that um, an acknowledgement that the initial intent is for the workforce housing to be included because there is not a requirement um, that workforce housing be provided as part of this even though there is that intent. And from a practical perspective, it would be challenging, you know, both with the eviction laws and from a, um, a political perspective for the university to convert staff and faculty housing to student housing. Um, and so I recognize that is, is the case, but I just, we wanted to be clear with okay. the council Understood. of those facts. Uh, what I'm going to recommend to the council is if we might do this, there have been a very large number of meetings uh, involving all the parties um, for the last couple of months in which every single word has been debated, discussed, and agreed upon. Uh, I don't think it makes sense here on National Last Minute Day to, <laughs> to uh, have us craft a, even a sentence that you haven't worked on together. So my recommendation is we continue this item for about a half an hour. Let's start. Let's, I don't imagine item 28 is going to take a long time. I want to go to item 28, return to this item, and I would ask you folks to Mr. Butler for you and the city attorney to get us a sentence or two that adds on to this recommendation. I don't think we should be crafting this at the council. I want you to craft it present it to us as part of your recommendation. You're going to probably have 10 or 15 minutes to do so. Is there any objection to that process? If I may, Mayor, I've been working with city staff on some language to address this. You have language on this? I do. Has this language been shared with everyone? I've been working with city manager and director Butler. Okay. Well, so can I propose it? That, that works very well. That'll work very well. 
Go ahead. Okay. Well, let's let, let's get a motion on the floor. I will move. I will move staff recommendation. Very good. Um, with the clarification that the operating memorandum memor memorialize the current proposal for UC to use the 62 unit building as workforce housing and acknowledging the, I'll, I'll send this to you, and acknowledging the offer of the additional 12 units of moderate rate affordable housing beyond the seven low income units required in perpetuity. Is it, I, I need some indication here. This, yes, okay, there's non objection language among the parties that have been negotiating this. That language worked for everybody. You gotta raise your hand if there's a problem with that. If you're the city, the developer, the staff, whoever. Does that language work or not work? Mr. Lay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, I'm Doug Lay. I'm a member of the great Santa Cruz High School class of 1969, just wanna remind you. Um, would you mind just reading it again more slowly? We literally have labored over this for a long time, and so we want to be careful that we all agree on what it says. Thanks. Absolutely. I just sent it to Ms. Bush, and I'll read it. Um, Can we hold for one yeah. minute while she puts it up on the screen? Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Be Okay, so motion to approve staff recommendations with the clarification that the operating memorandum memorialize the current proposal for UC to use the 62 unit building as workforce housing and acknowledging the offer of the additional 12 units of moderate rate affordable housing beyond the seven low income units required in perpetuity. Yeah, so the, can I just comment on this? Because the beyond the, the required in perpetuity creates could create some confusion. The seven low income units are in perpetuity, right? The 12 are for so long as the university uses it as workforce housing. And then it should, I would insert, I'll defer to my counsel here, but I would also insert that memorialize the current proposal for UC to initially use they do will not will they cannot commit to to perpetuity for this building. That's all. It will be used for that initially. Okay, well maybe we do need to go back to this. We're going to continue this item. We are moving to item 28. This is uh, from the uh, Economic Development and Housing Department. A consideration of purchase sale agreement between the City of Santa Cruz, City of Scotts Valley, involving Sky Park. On the item. On the item, anyone presenting on the item? Council members, uh, we, we discussed this briefly in previous setting. Does anyone have questions or comments? Seeing hearing none, is there anyone with us in the public who wishes to comment on item 28? Anyone online? Sorry, can I just clarify? Did you yes, reorder the agenda to do 28 before 27? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, my thinking was that item 27 might go for a minute. I wanted to do an I dispense with an item that can be handled quickly. Any question on Sky Park issue? Oh, Do you wish to make any presentation on item 28? I have a presentation prepared. I have a PowerPoint prepared, but I can actually briefly speak to it. There we go. Okay. Good afternoon again, Mayor afternoon. and members of the council. The item before you today is the Sky Park um, property that the city owns in the city of Scotts Valley. It's 8.15 acres. We've owned it. Um, it used to be the airport mm -hmm. and was closed in 1982. Over the last 20, or actually close to 30 years, but the first sort of 20, 30 years, it was subject to an owner participation agreement between the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Scotts Valley. 
for development of a, a town center for Scotts Valley. And after the redevelopment terminated, um, basically it was no longer possible to have an, an owner participation agreement. So we entered into a series of interests from developers for purchase sale agreements. They, three previous ones fell through just from project feasibility. Um, since that time, since about 2019, we've been in direct negotiations with the city of Scotts Valley for a purchase between the two cities. Um, the site is well known to have some contamination from two different sources. Mainly, though, it's from the former dry cleaners and the Kmart Center. Um, we've had that uh, fully characterized over the years. And um, Scotts Valley offered to actually front the funding to clean up the surface contamination, not dealing with the underground contamination. The surface contamination is largely related to the former airport operations, so some arsenic, some lead, and some things like that. That's been since cleaned up. It was 270000 And so we further negotiated the purchase price based on the initial fair market value of $8 million with the credit for the remediation and then a further credit acknowledging the deed restriction for the underground contamination that will need a soil management plan and vapor sort of future barrier on the deed for any future development. All that said, we came to a agreed purchase price of $7.5 million and agreed to carry the note for the city of Scotts Valley. So they have two options for financing. It's a 4.5% interest. Um, amortized either on a straight eight-year amortization schedule or on a 15-year with a balloon payment in an eight. And so they'll get to choose that option during escrow. So um, they've agreed to the terms. Um, the rest of the terms are pretty standard. Um, one thing to point out that is different from uh, the packet is that we have been back and forth with both the city of Scotts Valley, but also just in recent purchase sales and in really interpreting the latest language around the Surplus Lands Act, and we want to make sure we're fully compliant before we go through with the sale. So we do have a recommendation for a slight modification to the recommendation that's in your package. And um, we'd like to put that up. And I'm sure, Bonnie, can you put that up? OK, great. And then in addition um, to that, there is a motion um, that Councilmember Newsom um, had reached out in advance that he would like to make. Um, typically, we have uh, proceeds that go to straight to the public trust fund. And Councilmember Newsom did reach out with a specific um, request and direction for a motion he'd like to make. So we went ahead and put that up on the screen. And I'll let Councilmember Newsom um, speak to that one. But specifically, the language, um, the additional language that's not in your packet is in the first um, part of the motion. And that is that upon confirmation of the State Department of Housing and Community Development, that the transaction is consistent with the Surplus Land Act, then the City Council directs uh, the City Manager to in execute the purchase sale agreement. And the rest of the resolution and recommendation is as in the packet. Very good. Thank you. Now let me ask if there are questions and comments on the item. Excuse me, Ms. Watkins is recognized. I just have a brief comment. Certainly. I just want to say uh, thank you to Bonnie and the team. This has been, gosh, I think, Sandy, maybe you can confirm, I think on the council agenda off and on for my entire, our entire term. Um, and it's a really good thing for our partners mm -hmm. up north. And we wish them the best in their endeavors to create a town center in Scotts Valley. And um, really appreciate your negotiation and work to get to this place to have it on our agenda publicly. So um, anyways, I just want to acknowledge Thank all you. the work and time that's been kind of put into this item to get here today. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Thank you. Uh, I do want to make a comment about that, um, and then I do have a quick question about the motion. Um, really, yeah, it's it's been we've had you know these these false starts or, or not really false starts, but really high hopes that um, we were going to get this done. Uh, oh, and and you really have, Bonnie, um, put so much energy and creative thinking, problem solving into making this happen. I'm 
happy for the city of Scotts Valley that they're going to have an opportunity to hopefully to work with partners to develop this land and make a contribution to the housing stock as well as um, developing their town center. So just thank you so very much for um, guiding us through this. It's I didn't think it was going to happen before we were done. <laughs> I mean, here we are. Yay. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question on the... Um, the request for the contribution to the affordable housing library project. Um, it, would this be for, um, I guess I just want to make sure that we're talking about e the affordable housing and library components um, as opposed to the garage component, which we've been told is being funded by the parking, parking fund. So I just want to make sure that's the intention. Um, yes. OK. Thank you. Um, Got it. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Newsom, do you want to, we don't have a motion yet. We're going to, uh, I don't believe. Do we have a motion, Ms. Bush? No, I didn't think so. Uh, I'll, make, uh, very, I'll make a motion to uh, accept the staff recommendation along with the added direction that was shown on the screen. All right. Uh, to Let's deposit the proceeds back up on into the, screen. the uh, Everybody will see it. downtown affordable There's housing library project. Second by Ms. Gontari Johnson. Make sure we, we can put this up on the screen just for, uh, make sure we got this. Okay, so the motion is uh, items one and two, correct? That is not the motion that is in our packet. This is now the motion. That is correct. Okay, that is a motion by, by Mr. Newsom, second by Ms. Gallantari Johnson under debate and discussion. Council members? All right, I do have someone online. Certainly. Mm -hmm. We'll take that person online. Good afternoon. Welcome. Yeah, sure. This is good. Sure, I'll comment on this. I got comments and a suggestion. I'll start with the comment that this Sky Park land sale, a sale of a valuable public asset, needs some consideration that it is a sale of essentially a non depreciable asset, and land values really always go up, and that the uses of this money should take that into consideration. For instance, one wonders uh, if you intend to take this permanently viable asset uh, and blow the money on a somewhat temporal project. Well, actually, it sounds like you're not. But anyway, that destination mentioned for the money, the public trust fund, or the original, I guess, uh, idea, was somewhat mysterious to me as to its allowed uses. And I think it was exclusively uh, for use, uh, that trust fund, for somewhat long-lasting CIP projects. But I see over time that fund's been rated for a variety of purposes. Um, anyway, considering the city's poor record of fiscal management and propensity to overspend its budget no matter how much income it receives over time, perhaps it is time instead to create a different fund and budget process whereby the general fund reserve has a target uh, that was suggested of annual operating uh, budget percentage, and this money could be placed there instead to help replace that fund yearly but with future year budget rules to be put in place, making a priority to allocate some reserve fund replacements in the case when the year-end reserve funds are below a certain low amount, spend according to policy when above, along with excess income. Uh, but when the fund is drawn down, it, there is a must rebuild the fund level. Now, I know, I don't know how that would actually be written, but generally there sure seems to be a need to put better fiscal management policies uh, into place, if not actual law. There needs to be more earned public trust in the public trust funds. If you make good on all the shiny object spending promises you made selling Measure L to the public, uh, the city, it seems to me, as we're told, is still going to be losing fiscal ground to expenses, and its fiscal problems are not then fully addressed. The passage of L does not mean you should spend and pretend there still isn't a problem and kick the fiscal can down the road like no big deal, uh, about to be out of money at a future date. As to the price... Uh, with 900,000 an acre, that's a handsome price if it's farmland outside Watsonville. But for the middle of Scotts Valley, that seems a little low. It was praised a little higher. What do I know? As to all the many other considerations, it sure seems like this draft contained an awful lot of important and changeable conditions with financial implications. So I'm kind of wondering why you are approving a draft document, or does your approval make the draft the final thing? I don't know, because there's a lot of things in there that have fiscal uh, have uncertainties that have a uh, fiscal impact. Uh, the financing at 4.5% interest seems like a real bonus, but you know what? Even the federal government's paying more than that on 10- and 20-year Treasury bonds. So maybe that's low. 
Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Matters back before the body, further debate or discussion? Mr. Newsom. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. I just want to um, just uh, speak on the motion real quick and just thank Director Lipscomb for her work on the agreement. Um, and you know, I approve of this item and the added direction will provide $7.75 million towards building 124 units of affordable housing in our community and providing our community with a community child care center and state of the art library in our community. So I'm very excited uh, for this uh, agenda item and the uh, direction that was added and happy to support it. Further debate or discussion? Ms. Bruner. Um, so on the added language of the motion to direct the funds to the uh, upcoming library affordable housing development, um, it, if that wasn't part of it, where would those funds go? Um, the city's policy is for sale of city property to go into the public trust fund. And um, when do funds go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund? Um, funds go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, when they're sort of in lieu fees um, and paid on development projects in lieu of building affordable housing and projects is typically how we um, secure funding into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Sometimes we're able to leverage um, state grant programs into securing additional funding into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Further debate or discussion? One of the reasons I think this, uh, your addition to this motion is good, you should use one-time revenues for one-time expenditures. You shouldn't use one-time revenue for ongoing expenditures. So I think basically this is a sale of a capital asset. We're going to put it into a capital asset. I think, that's, I think that's good fiscal policy. Further debate or discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Member Newsom? Aye. Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeler? Aye. Good work. Mm -hmm. Good work. Congratulations on that. We are back on item 26. This is on the Delaware edition. When we were on this item previously, there was a question about some final word, uh, some final language. Mr. Butler, do you have that language now? Ms. Bush, you have that language from Mr. Butler? I just got it. I'll put it on my... Mr. Butler, stay up here. I have to type it up because it was... Mr. Butler, question to you. On page 28, I'm sorry, excuse me, 26.1, the language is on here now. 
Is this in addition to the language on page 26.1? That's correct. It would be Thank the you. staff recommendations with these clarifications. Very good. Thank you. Ms. Bush, reset for me. Do we have a motion or a second on this item? I don't know that we have a second. I know you tried to. I made the motion. Motion. Second by Ms. Bruner. I'm assuming that includes this additional language. Yes. Very so good. This, so this, this would be the motion. Very oh, good. OK. You may open on your motion. OK, well, I had. Um, maturely made comments, but I do have some additional comments just in response to my colleagues' um, comments earlier uh, about affordable housing, um, and we'll probably debate this forever, but um, all housing is needed. All housing at all levels is going to contribute to the housing crisis that we have. Um, we know for a fact that our educators are leaving our community um, because of affordability issues, and guess what? They don't qualify for very low income housing. Um, so yes to very low income housing, um, yes to moderate rate affordable housing, yes to market rate housing. And there's a way to do this um, in a way that works with the community. There's a way to do this that doesn't. We saw this a little bit earlier when we continued one of the items. So yes, I will thank partners who are working with us in good faith to bring much needed workforce, moderate rate housing, um, so that's it. That's, those are my comments. Good. For the debate or discussion, Ms. Watkins is recognized. Um, I appreciate the comments. And I know there's been a lot of work in between the city and the developer to make this project or sort of have these different iterations come through. Um, I won't be supporting the motion. And I think it's because I've been on the council long enough to remember how this project was originally proposed. And that was as condos, as residential, as a mix between industrial work workforce and um, residents, not as a UCSE uh, student housing project. Um, and certainly not as a temporary, potentially temporary workforce housing, given the additional recommendation that was just moments ago established. So for me, it doesn't really feel like it's consistent with our community engagement efforts um, and doesn't feel minor in terms of a shift for me. Um, so I appreciate the uh, comments. I appreciate the direction. I, I totally understand. I certainly know that we need more housing. I know we need more housing for students for faculty and for everybody else. Um, but for me, this uh, I've really struggled to really see how the process really reflects what, um, what I would like to see based on what I was previously told this was going to be to what it is being proposed as now. So for those reasons, I won't be, be supporting the motion. Very good. For I, the questions? Or I have a comment me. as well. Ms. Brown, certainly. Uh, if you want to go to the left, that's OK. I'm right with you. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, I, I, I want to also, I, I won't be supporting the motion. Um, I would, rather than repeating Councilmember Watkins' comments, just echo those, um, associate myself with those. And I want to add a few other points here um, <clears throat> related to the question around community engagement and the the original vision and the significant change that's being made here, which I don't necessarily oppose. Students need housing, too. I understand that. You need to find a way forward to develop that, those parcels um, the, the, for the project. I understand that. Um, but the agenda report that we received and the materials we received really, I mean, this is a sleeper item, um, and it really does not provide a clear picture for the public or for council members uh, what is being asked here. All of the reference, or most of the reference documents were not available to me. Um, when I looked for them over the weekend, and I'm not saying that they're being withheld, but um, they're, I tried to get them through the public process, you know, public website, not available. Um, there's no, uh, aside from the kind of plan, that, that site plan that we see, there's really no sense of what this project is for the public. The only reason I understood what was, go what the, what was being asked and could follow along is because we've had conversations as a council in closed session about this. And so I think that um, there are going to be a lot of unhappy Westsiders, and I wish the Vice Mayor luck in um, the, you know, communicating 
uh, when you know when it becomes clear what's going on here. Um, in addition to the kind of you know my believing that the agenda material should have included a full description of this pro the proposed project. Um, with the conditions of approval and the development agreement. Um, we're being asked to just trust that um, we, we cannot do anything about the affordable housing percentages that were included in that original agreement. And I want to be clear here that if you count moderate income at 120% of median as affordable units, which I, I would not, even if those units are included, the total number of units for, um, that are either affordable or moderate will be 11% of this project. It's less than 4% for the low income units. Less than 4%. We have an inclusionary uh, ordinance requiring 20%. I believe the gymnastics we're going through here with an operating memorandum is primarily intended to um, <laughs> to. to uh, evade um, uh, the uh, doing anything more on inclusionary um, and we need affordable we need all units but we need affordable units because the people in our community who are being displaced um, it, it is tearing the fabric of our community apart and I want to just add for those who have been communicating with me and other folks in the public who are listening to this that um, I'm heartened by a recent judge's ruling that density does not equal affordability there's no evidence of that and that evidence needs to be provided before we suggest that big projects um, with low numbers of affordable units are going to get are going to make a dent in our affordable housing crisis. So um, I, I can't support this uh, today. I, I am not in any way suggesting that the developers are acting in bad faith. Um, but I believe that we have a responsibility to maximize affordability and that we have a responsibility to ensure the community is informed when we're making decisions about projects of this scale in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Ms. Bruner. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to state that um, I will be supporting this motion. I think, you know, I've had um, a lot of information and data. It's really helpful to hear historical context with our other two council members who spoke. Um, and, you know, housing in our community is a number one priority for all involved. This project, this development, um, from all the materials and uh, information has started a long time ago. And I think it's reached a point where this is a determination of compliance with a tenant that they have um, um, been in connection with. And um, to be able to um, have this uh, these housing units for workforce housing, I think, is huge. Um, many members in the community um, that do not qualify for um, other housing, this, this fits into the development area and the scope of what's around. And um, students live everywhere in the city of Santa Cruz. So they have a tenant that um, is really working. I think this has been a great collaboration. It's a good solution that meets community needs. And um, um, I, I think moving forward with this operational memorandum um, to make a finding of consistency of compliance and the clarifications is a positive step. So thank you. Other questions or comments? Councilmember Watkins. I forgot to mention earlier, mm -hmm. I do think that the question of uh, around clarity for what's determined as an educational facility should ultimately be decided at some point, given the university is going to be growing and most likely will be looking to have more housing on or in the city in addition to on campus. So I think in terms of a further direction for uh, future items that that be established or figured out. Just, just direction doesn't necessarily have to be a friendly amendment. Thank you. The vice mayor is recognized. So I just wanted to briefly comment on um, the challenges that the university faces when building housing on campus, the financing that they have to go through. Um, and with all due respect, Councilmember Brown, I think that if they were to sell this property and another developer came in, we could end up with eight or 10 stories. I think that would be less desirable on the far west side. 
um, perhaps more of the units would be affordable in the sense that you're describing. But I agree with Council Member Kalantari Johnson that there's a, a huge missing middle in our community. We've met our arena numbers at every affordability rate. And as the university continues to grow, the workforce needs to grow with it. And we have to take that into consideration. Um, and in my opinion, when they're trying to fill um, that housing need um, that the university brings, I'd rather see this project develop than having them, um, the regents, purchasing existing apartment complexes like they did on Western and displacing residents. So I think this process, although it's deviated from what you originally had approved, um, and people might not be happy with it, I think they'd be a lot less happy with what could be given the current landscape and the state laws. So that's all I'd like to just comment on that. Yes, yeah, so sorry. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> no back and forth. Of course you can. Council Member Watkins is recognized. I just want to make sure I was clear when I understood the workforce housing addition. My understanding based on what the agreement is, is that that's not guaranteed. Is that is that correct? I just want to make sure I, I'm, that's clear because that's how I read that. Thanks for that question, Councilmember Watkins. So um, the way that it's worded is that, and, and what the applicant has indicated is that they will not sign the lease for the property if you see is not initially offering that as workforce housing. There is not a requirement that it stays as workforce housing, um, although there are some practical challenges to it converting from workforce housing to student housing. Not saying that couldn't be done. There just are some practical challenges associated with it. And so um, the the university here is is the one um, making that determination and um, and and that offer. And and they were not willing to say in perpetuity, knowing that they may own that property um, for you know in, in perpetuity and their plans could change um, so that was um, that's essentially how that conversation went and the proposal um, is as I mentioned um, that initial um, offering um, in, a, in agreement with the landlord who we heard from would be to workforce housing but there is no guarantee that it would continue as workforce housing in the long term. I just appreciate the clarification. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on that. And I think, you know, great for the initial, I don't want to be, um, you know, too uh, suspect, but I think there's also a real, you know, a real possibility that will likely become student housing as well. So workforce housing will continue to remain a, an issue and priority that we'll all mm -hmm. need to address as well. Thanks. Welcome. Through the debate or discussion, seeing, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Aziza? Aye. Brown? No. No. Brunner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Thank you to all involved in a compound complex issue. The motion passes and so ordered. We are on item number 20. Seven. This is the collective results and evidence-based investments update. Ms. Schmidt, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Laura Schmidt, your Assistant City Manager. Um, pardon my voice, I'm recovering from some bronchitis. I am very happy uh, to have you with us to talk about CORE in our next cycle for our request for proposal. We have with us our county partners, and they'll be sharing a PowerPoint to take us through the various conversations and feedback that we need from you in order to take the next step to be able to release our next cycle for a request for proposal on time this summer. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Randy Morris from the County of Santa Cruz. Um, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, y'all. I have been the human services director for four years. I've been in front of you maybe five or six times, but all virtual. So it's an honor to be in your house in person for the first time. 
Also want to use the opportunity, uh, given the challenge of coming together between jurisdictions to braid money, it's not simple. Express my thanks to Laura. Um, we are feeling very sad about losing her. Um, she's been a wonderful partner. Um, and sorry, I didn't give M4 warning. She's one of the most organized human beings I've met. Just look at her sticky notes on the wall behind her. But sincerely, um, this is complicated because we're bringing together some of your money, some of the county's money, braiding it together in a scarcity model where we do not have enough money to help community-based organizations help the most in need in our community. So it's been complicated, but the staff-to-staff -staff relationship's been very positive. Going to miss you, Laura. Sorry you're sick. Um, okay, so the PowerPoint is up. Um, as is um, very intentional and very careful, we work very hard between staff to not, because we have two jurisdictions, we always do our best to go to the board, which is in the morning, and we recognize when we come to your council in the afternoon, there's always been a vote in the morning, and you have full discretion to agree or not agree, but I'm sort of appreciative of the context of that. So we did, um, we were in front of our board this morning, and the board item did pass. Um, so um, you were in council, so that did pass, um, but then we wait to answer any questions, and we hope as staff to bring together something that's mutually agreeable so you can support as well, but you have the discretion, because it's your money, to sort of deviate if you'd like. Um, so in front of you today, and Laura, is this just right and left? Okay, here we go. Okay. So um, I'm going to go through some timeline and next steps because your council and our board supported um, a very specific timeline and I want to spend a little bit of time explaining why. I'm then going to turn it over to our Human Services uh, Deputy Director uh, Kimberly Peterson who's here and then I'm going to come back and explain the recommended actions and then we'll of course entertain any questions so you can make an informed decision. Um, oh, this keeps going backwards, Laura. Can you move it forward to... I'll do that. Okay, so let me take a minute to explain to you. This is, you know, this clearly is um, money that has been very controversial in this community. I've been here four years. The history of this predates me. It's very limited general fund. It's actually two percent of my human services department budget. And when you put together the county healthcare agency budget with it, which kind of shares the safety network, this is actually only one percent of the money that is sort of in the community helping the most vulnerable but it is one of the most controversial and why it is one of the only funding sources that the city council and the board have 100% say over. It's your money. Most everything else we manage in the health and human services safety net space is categorically limited, restricted, so when we're in front of our local elected bodies, there's not a lot of discretion because the feds and state have told us what to do, so I recognize that history, and I do recognize as a newer member of this community, there's a long, proud history of um, recognizing the important role in the safety net of CBOs, healthy and thriving, and they are struggling. Um, I just heard your previous item about affordable housing. They're struggling to find a way to pay their... So this is complicated. This timeline was brought forward to the board and your council a year ago, specifically as a lesson learned from the prior procurement, which happened in an unbelievable time in the middle of COVID, the Omicron variant hit, we got pushed to the, to the wall. It was very, very um, controversial. And it was actually the first time ever that there was a big change in the recommended awards based on the um, recommendations. And there's a lot of upset. There's a lot of appreciation, celebration, anger. So we went through a very comprehensive lessons learned process and this timeline was proposed to the board and your um, city council to say this is one way to kind of create more space to have more conversation and have less backed up against the wall right at the very end when the decisions are made. So what's in front of you today is we in summer and winter went through a very active community engagement process with the CBOs. We interviewed elected officials from your council and our board. Um, we had a lot of dialogue, and then we came forward and said, can we move the process back six months so there's more time? And number two, what's up here, can we create more public opportunities for elected officials to weigh in and give direction rather than just having to accept recommended awards at the very last minute? So those, that timeline was in response to those changes. You will see up there one, two, three, because today is opportunity number one to weigh in and give us your prioritization direction and you can accept the staff recommendation or not. But then we've added number two, which didn't, has never existed before, which is to create more space to get all the applications and then come back to both elected bodies and the public to hear a summary of what's come in, to give you another chance to give us further direction, and then come back yet again um, with recommended awards, which 
elected officials always have the right because it's general fund to over, override. And you'll hear in um, Kimberly's part of the presentation, we've actually added even one more opportunity for you to have a little bit of flexible funding to sort of figure out how to address emerging priorities um, and or fund agencies not funded. So all of that has been built in in response to the last procurement to create more of an open, transparent process. I also want to recognize there was one moment that um, went to the Board of Supervisors last month and not to your council, um, and I will invite the city manager's office to make sure I'm not misrepresenting Mr. Huffaker. Um, but we work very, very actively in obviously one of the most complicated policy spaces, and that's housing and homelessness. And in that space, we have a six-month report in under Dr. Robert Ratner, who's the um, Housing for Health Director in my department. And we have six-month report ins to the board. And when, as we have been looking at what if both of our tax measures pass, and what do we do with the growing crisis of unsheltered and lack of prevention, we would be remiss as staff if we didn't talk together, city staff and county staff, to at least present options to both elected bodies given the Solomon choice in front of all of us. We can pretend, I think it's a little magical thinking that the feds and state are gonna fund fully and richly what we need to do, but we felt it was our responsibility to lift up to you some choices to consider with core whether or not you want to use some of that money to purpose towards what your council and the board already recommended, which is to focus on affordable housing and shelter. You already made that approval in December. So we have went to the board in March and said, would you support us coming back in April and list a couple of options for how to effectuate that money? That was done in consult with your city staff. Um, it did not make any decisions. It just said, we want to come forward with some options. So included in today, is one of the recommended actions, which I will close out with, is um, those options that we lifted up. And one of them is a very recommendation between um, Moore, Matt, and the homeless team um, that we are putting together in the core opportunity. And we'll explain why when we get into more detail. So with that said, I'm now gonna turn it over to Kimberly Laura, if you can go to the next slide. And she's gonna summarize all of the, it, all of the items we incorporate in this RFP based on um, lessons learned and feedback from both elected and CBOs, and the one item we did not and why, um, just to be very transparent and open, and I'll turn it over to Kimberly to walk that through, and then I'll come back for the recommended um, actions. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you, good afternoon. So as Randy mentioned, over the course of the uh, lessons learned and com community engagement process and the handful of public meetings that we have, had, we received a lot of feedback on what should be in the next RFP. And then in December, we heard feedback from the Board of Supervisors regarding what they're interested in. And then um, uh, uh, my colleague Amanda Geip and I uh, were here, I think in uh, February, January or February, um, with, the, um, with one of the subcommittees. And we heard additional um, input from those subcommittee members on what they're interested in seeing in this RFP. And so uh, you can see highlights on this slide of what we've included and what we've kept and, and did not include. So we have included a simplified application that is more aligned with what the structure of the scope of work would be if an agency is awarded funding. We've also maintained a tier structure, but we've restricted large organizations, which we define as organizations with a revenue of 7.5 million or more from applying for, for the small tier grants. And this is in response to feedback that we received that small organizations with less capacity should not have to compete for funding for small grants with large organizations. We also have a simplified conflict of interest form for the review panels. Um, the updated form should make it easier for us to recruit and have more demographically and racially diverse review panels. We've also included a detailed scoring rubric in the RFP materials. So what you see will actually be the rubric that would be used to review the submitted applications. In response to the request to give more scoring weight to proposals that can leverage their funding, we've made five bonus points available for medium and large size applications that can demonstrate the ability to leverage. We've also included a handful of questions on the application that were requested, such as, was a grant writer used? Is the program being proposed new or existing? And we've asked for the size of the agency and program budget. 
We also plan to issue an electronic intent to apply survey that will ask for which core condition agencies intend to apply for and at what level of funding. The survey will be non-binding nor mandatory, but uh, it will help us prepare the review panels. Then in response to a board member request to create flexibility in the structure of core for unanticipated needs, we recommend setting aside 15% of the RFP funding for elected officials to have available to address unanticipated priorities at the time of recommended award or to fund agencies that were not recommended. And then we've also adjusted the discretion we have as staff. So last year, when it came to recommend, recommended awards, we had the ability to trim the budgets of the, um, of the grantees by up to 10%. This year, we're saying we'll just um, trim those no more than 5%. We need the little bit of flexibility to ensure that all of the core funding is expended, but that we also are able to fit what is recommended within the existing budget. So then we also have a handful of things that we continued into this next uh, RFP. As I mentioned, we maintained the tiered funding structure with tiers uh, one, two, and three representing large, medium, and small size grants. Large grants would be available up to $500,000, medium size grants up to $150,000, and a small size grant would be um, up to $25,000. We did not include a targeted impact grant this round, and that's because with this structure, we've already narrowed down to a smaller number of core conditions, which helps narrow the um, collective impact um, in a more focused way um, compared to uh, what we had last time. There is one exception to the tier structure in that for the healthy environments core condition, uh, we would have only small and large size grants available within that category. And the reason for that is that of the core conditions that we have for this RFP, the majority of the existing grants fall within the categories of thriving families, lifelong learning, and stable and affordable housing. There's actually no current grants in the category of healthy environments. And even last round, I think we only received one or maybe just two applications in that category. And so we felt that by having a large, one or more potential large size grants for healthy environments would pull too much from the historic priority services that the funding's been used for. We have also continued a 25% cap on funding, meaning that um, the most any one agency can apply for is 25% of the entire core RFP budget. And then for past performance, uh, we heard request for us to look at past performance. Um, we are highlighting that any organization that is not eligible to contract with the county, including those that have lost the ability to contract with us, would not be eligible for an award. And then for data collection, we've maintained and clarified data collection requirements so we can report on outcomes relative to the programs funded with the core money. And then lastly, um, the, we've continued that um, services provided through core funding are for Santa Cruz County residents. And a specific, since we're here at the city, um, I'm here at the city council right now, it also includes um, the same language that we had in their last round, is that the city money would be used for programs primarily serving Santa Cruz city residents. So we did spend a lot of time trying to incorporate as many of the requests and incorporate the feedback that we heard from community elected officials and um, through all of the processes that we've um, participated in up to this point. There was one piece of feedback that we, after careful consideration and research, did not include and are not recommending. And that is, uh, we had a request that board members have access to review the applications, and we're not including that. Um, the reason is that it's not standard county practice. It's actually not um, standard city practice either. It's not best practice um, according to state and local government procurements. 
And a part of that is that when an RFP review um, process happens, there's panelists who are trained on the scoring rubric. They sign a confidential, um, they sign a conflict of interest form. They maintain confidentiality during the process. It's really designed for a fair, equitable review. Um, the, all the applicants don't have um, access to one another's applications. It's not, and it's not public to reduce outside influence. And during the last round, for example, we received 127 applications. If um, the board members or elected officials had access to all of the applications during the process, then by essence, all of those documents would be public documents, opening the process to outside influence and potentially um, threatening the integrity of what a typical RFP process is. And then the final thing related to that is that as elected officials, um, when we bring recommended awards to you, you have the ability to approve, change, or deny, um, override anything that we bring to you. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Randy. Thank you. Mr. Morris. Yes. Proceed. OK. <laughs> um, I also want to say um, we, in communication with your staff, do not have in front of you as the council today what was um, effectuated last round, which will be brought back to your council, which is the template that was used last time to have your council officially approve the RFP being administered by the county under an MOU that your legal counsel and our legal counsel reviews and approved. We have that template in place. There's a journaling process. And just to say a touch, I, I apologize if I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and I'm wrong, but that comment that Kimberly made about what percentage of your money goes to city residents and countywide was a very, um, I think, deliberate and open conversation at your city council. I remember sitting on Zoom and hearing it. And I am only sharing this to say this is what you decided last time, but there will be ample time for you to discuss and deliberate next. How you landed was you would not contribute any of your money to services that were exclusively for South County or non-City of Santa Cruz residents, but that you did want your money to go to programs that were exclusively City of Santa Cruz or countywide, including City of Santa Cruz. But that's a choice you have in front of you. But I just want to let you know that's what you decided last time. And we have lots of room, as in one of the reasons this is six months moved up, there's lots of room for that conversation to play out again. And we sort of follow your lead about where you want your money to go once you have that platform of recommended awards and applications. So I just want to make sure you know that history and there's opportunity for you to figure out where you want your money to go. That's what you did last time. That doesn't mean you have to do it again. Um, okay, so the recommended actions in front of you. And again, I just kind of recognize um, the timing is a little bit awkward. You know, we go to the board, our board approves, but you have full discretion to agree or not with this. But um, the ex standard accept and file. Um, the next was to just continue to have your staff coordinate with us, if approved, to release the RFP pending your decision today. I want to be very clear that it also said, and include any additional direction. There was some debate this morning at the board, or actually early afternoon at the board, but there was no additional direction. But if you gave additional direction to avoid having to come back to, to make the RFP again, we would just incorporate that additional direction. Um, then this hearing, no later than October 29th, is absolutely and definitively an effort to apply a lessons learned last time to lessen the pain point of having one big decision right at the last minute. So we plan to come back to the board and to your council on the same day if we can work it out, which we always try to do, to give a summary of everything that's come in. So right now it's kind of a conceptual RFP and we don't know if we're going to get, you know, 20 times the amount in this core condition and not enough in this. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to weigh in again uh, uh, intentionally because the goal is to put the CBOs, you as the elected body, and us as staff less in the position of a hard discussion and kind of parse out and chunk out the decision points along the way. So by the time we get to recommended awards, it's hopefully more agreeable and in line with your direction with your money. The last two are the ones that are sort of the most complex. So we have a slide on each to kind of walk these through a little bit more. And that is the first is what I said. We got board approval to just bring options. No decisions were made. Bring options for consideration for both elected bodies. Given the decision was made and approved by your council and our board to focus on the core condition of basically shelter and homeless prevention. So to that end, we brought forward three items this morning with one recommendation as staff recommendation that is absolutely lock and step in concert with your staff and your city manager's office. So I just want to make sure this was vetted very, very thoroughly with um, your city manager's office. So if you go to the next slide, I'll walk through this one. 
So the three options are to, uh, option one, to carve out 1.5 million of the rough, roughly 6 million. And the way this would work is the 1 million I'll focus on first is shelter. And that would be 700, and this is in the materials, but just to walk it through, $750,000 of the county contribution, $250,000 of your city contribution. So it's one fourth of yours. And that money would be spread as follows. $250,000 county money to our South County Navigation Center we're working to stand up. $250,000 to our Mid-County Navigation to Center stand up, which right now, as discussed, is in um, Supervisor Koenig's uh, District 1. And then $250,000 towards North County, comma, enter collaboration with your team. Our 250 and your 250 would e be spread towards the Housing Matters Navigation Shelter and your Armory program. We currently, as drafted in the materials, have it as sharing both ways. It's a very important symbolic partnership. We are both deeply underfunded. We both need to find more general fund to sustain those programs. And if approved, this item would move out of the core FP. $1.5 million, including the $1 million shelter, would be moved to a procurement process, lock and step with your city manager's office, still back in front of you to see where it's going. But it would be moved out of the core FP, and it would give us some general fund base money to address what is on the lower right of that screen. Mm -hmm. We sadly, I am 30 years in the safety net. I'm new to overseeing homeless services. It's the biggest cluster I've ever seen in my po political career. It's just a scarcity model where everyone's yelling and screaming, and the governance makes no sense. The Fed say this, the federal courts say that, the federal HUD says this, the state's not lock and step, and we're all fighting. This is the money. The reason why that bar graph, which is the money that we as a kind of county and city partnership have, is going down dramatically is because of your $14 million earmark. So if that is not re-upped, the federal and state grants, and Dr. Ratner is magic. Everything applies for he gets, but there's no federal and state grants to pay for emergency shelter. It's just the reality of the way the state and feds fund stuff, and we're left fighting about general fund. This is a moment for us to lean in and say, do we want to put some general fund? And let me be clear, it would not be the full funding source of sustaining shelter. It's base funding, which makes us more competitive for future grants. And it's base funding to leverage things like CalAIM and Medi-Cal billing. And it helps give some base funding to the service providers, which right now we are desperately struggling for. And shelters open and close because we don't have enough base funding. So that's the shelter. $500,000 South County Prevention. There's a couple of data points up in the right. Very, very mindful. I did not create the point in time count. I am not saying it's a great metric, but we are federally mandated to run it. The continuum of care, which the federal government mandates, be run in every COC, continuum of care. That is the data point we have to use, so we use it. We saw a 29% decrease in the number of unsheltered during that day and the point in time in North County and a 15% increase in South County. You anecdotally talk to people who live in South County, including our staff who work in South County, the CBOs who work in South County, the visibility of homelessness is becoming more and more like your city. Something has changed dramatically in the last few years, and it matches the point in time count. Number two, across the state of California, for the first time in point in time counts, the Latinx population has grown and spiked dramatically, which is disproportionately represented in South County. And number three, when you look at homeless data that the federal school systems require school public schools to track, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District has the largest homeless population in this county. So we have an equity problem. We passed an equity statement, and we do not have enough money to put prevention money everywhere. So the county share is a county decision to invest where we have not invested um, historically. And this was discussed with very um, active conversation because we don't have any prevention, but this would be the county share to sort of invest in trying to kind of stop the bleeding that's happening um, overnight in South County over the last few years. Option two would be to maintain the $1 million of shelter funding and carve it out from procurement for the reasons I described and as I listed, but leave $500,000 in the core procurement, but have it be dedicated um, focus on issues addressing the core condition of affordable housing and shelter. We are not recommending that in large part because we did not have a housing for health division. I was not here under the former CAO, but from what I understand, the county did nothing around homelessness <laughs> until our new CAO stepped up. We've been working on it. 
We're growing it. We now have a Housing for Health division. Our board, your council, approved the first strategic plan. We have an organizing place to figure out how to braid money and fund things and to have core money over here and Housing for Health, who gets millions of dollars of a maze of money and have over there, is not collective impact, the CN core. So that's why we really recommend pushing it all into the Housing for Health. You have seats at that table. We come back to the council and to the board to look at that. But we think the crisis is severe, and it's the time, and this window will pass. Um, and then the last is just to not lean into this choice and leave it in the core RFP. I think from a CBO perspective, having had a number of them speak to me, they appreciate the idea of having the pot being bigger. I get that. I, I get that. And if you keep it in the core RFP, one of the things that we've discovered having the Housing for Health division is there is a um, disparate and fragmented funding system of one-off grants and contracts that are not organized very well. And we would like to shift this funding the best we can into that strategic plan to help braid the money better together. So those are the three options we listed with our recommendation for one for the reasons described. And I think with that, Laura, we close with just sort of, oh, yeah, procurement. Oof, one more. Oh, my. OK, so procurement. I'm pausing with a little bit of levity because um, let me be candid. A procurement carving out money from competitive procurement is an oxymoron. So you're either going to put money out to bid. And I have to say, coming to this community new, 40 years of just putting the money out over and over to the same organizations, it's a culture shock to say you actually have to compete. And it's become very clear to me that a number of the CBOs who got money for 40 years were shocked that when you open an application, you restart from zero. It's not your money. <laughs> but there was certainly a lot of behavior in this community that behaved as if it, it was my money, you took it from me. It's a procurement. Mm -hmm. So. This is a policy decision for elected officials. And if there's a procurement, it's a competition. You start from zero, you restart. But the Board of Supervisors last time recommended a carve out of one grant. And that is because C, collective impact, the local area agency on aging, which is the Federal Older Americans Act passed through the California Department of Aging, is a nonprofit under Seniors Council. And they have a procurement. And their procurement is purchasing home delivered meals for seniors, which has been a high priority for this community. And their procurement was at out the same time our procurement was out. And our board said, I don't want you to fund one agency here, one there. Carve that out. We want to commit some money to this and just augment whoever the AAA selects. That carve out occurred last time. We as staff are not recommending specifically a carve out, because then we start getting in the position of that's more important than that, than that, than that, than that. We felt this was your decision to make. And some of our board members said, make me make the hard decision. So I said, be careful what you ask for. Here you go. If you want to carve out something, give us direction. We will carve it out. If not, then it's an open procurement. So we put that as a recommendation. Do you have direction for a carve out? So with that, Laura, um, I think we're at the open. You got any questions for us or public comment, however you proceed, Mayor? Well, Mr. Moss, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to use this opportunity to thank you and the county. Uh, I believe in the last 13 months or so, the city and the county have mended our fences with each other and have uh, gotten to a place where through the one-on-one -on -one meetings, a number of other meetings, that um, we are essentially in harness pulling in the same direction. And I really appreciate your work and uh, your colleagues and the supervisor in the third district who has exercised a lot of leadership on this issue. Thank you for all of that. Let me ask you a question, uh, and I'm whoever wishes to answer it. Is it right that the core, when we look at all the money in core, that it's roughly five point? nine million dollars is that right that's what's in that bucket yes you have a little bit over one million we have a little bit under five million and added up it's a little bit shy of um just shy of six million and if i read it correctly that has two sources to it the county of santa cruz and the city of santa cruz that's what goes in there correct and then with regard to services uh the fact that Scotts Valley, Capitola, and Watsonville are not putting money in there does not mean that their residents don't receive services. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So 
why is it that we have this program and three of the four cities don't participate by putting in any money into it? Elected officials asking a staff person that question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear an answer well, from anybody. Well, I, I will say I this. Don't understand it. Well, I, I will just say this as a new set of eyes, and I hope this is okay. Kimberly's was the, an elected official in the city of Santa Cruz for four years, or um, city of Watsonville, and the mayor. And Carlos Palacios was in the seat. Matt was in prior to coming here, and so the city of Watsonville has a little bit of money. I, think, I don't know if it's called community programs. Capitol and Scotts Valley has a little bit of money. City of Santa Cruz, you all have history. Some of you have been here way longer than me. And I think there was a push to do collective impact and braid money. I think as far as we got was the city of Santa Cruz agreeing pre my time to step in, and the three other cities did not. When I got here four years ago, I was directed by the board to answer your very question, Mayor. And Matt, you were the Watsonville city manager, so I don't want to create awkwardness, but we asked. And in the end of the day, it's not our jurisdiction, but the end is, and you know, this was in the middle of COVID. It seems to me that at some, at some point, at least for me, it's not an issue of how much. It's an issue of, are they doing anything? Um, I mean, it's, it's inconceivable that on homelessness, none of those cities have a homeless problem. Um, I understand Watsonville's is getting more serious by the day, and but it's factually not true that Capitola and Scotts Valley don't have a homeless problem. It's that they don't provide homeless services. That's a different issue. And whether they put $10,000 or a penny or $2 million in is not my issue. It's why are we, the voters, of the taxpayers of the city of Santa Cruz, uh, putting a million dollars of discretionary general fund money into this without a contribution from at least two of those three cities? I think you could probably make an argument in Watsonville. I don't like the argument, but I think you could make an argument that they are a city that is very stretched on resources, is having an increase in homelessness, some of which was a result of the disasters and so on. Um, and, and we should respond to that. Um, I'm less, in, less clear why Capitola and Scotts Valley, uh, who, if I understand it correctly, um, well, I think you get my point. And I think that, that it is important for this body to at least consider the degree to which we should put a million dollars in when three cities put nothing in. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. I think that they should is my point. And again, I'm indifferent to what that amount is, but if one city and the county have enormous amounts of skin in the game, if you will, and three cities are staying out, uh, I'm baffled by it. Um, Mayor, if I may make one comment, mindful of this very tricky political Certainly. issue as somebody Certainly. who has been in the field for over 30 years, only four years here in COVID. So I feel still feel like a relatively new member. Mm -hmm. I'd like to bifurcate contributing to community-based organization contracts from investment in homeless services, which is jurisdictional contributions to historically the COC, which used to be called the HAP and now Housing Trials Partnership. My understanding is all four cities have historically put money into community programs. There were choices that were made by the other three cities to keep the money in their jurisdictions to go through their own process. And your city made the decision before my time mm -hmm. right. to braid the money together. But my understanding is the other three cities do put money into community organizations. They just made choices not to braid the money in this process for reasons that predate me. I want to separate that out from COC contributions. And that gets very tricky. We talk a lot with um, your city manager, my CAO, and I, I want to be very careful. But there is a history of the two big cities, Watsonville and the city, contributing got complicated in COVID yes. and the two smaller cities, I want to be careful not to be inappropriate, but their perceived role with their change in electeds and well, one change in city manager um, has shifted and it's a complicated issue that's political. Thank you. 
Let me go to the rest of the council, ask if there are questions or comments. Ms. Comptar Johnson, question. I, I'm sorry, I thought you had Yeah, I do. Well, I, I have a lot. <laughs> so I'm, well, I'll just jump get right in. Then. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you for the presentation and thank you so much for the work. I really appreciate the very clear improvements in the RFP. The scoring rubric made me really happy. Um, different forms of evaluation and just the additional touch points in the process. So I really appreciate it. But I do have a number of questions, not a but, and I have a number of questions. Um, some of them are a little bit in the weeds. Um, I noticed that the panelists, um, on their review, there's there's a so on the application there's a checking off if there's a grant writer used or not, and the pal so I, I want to know how the panelists will will I know it's not part of the scoring rubric, but how will the panelists consider that? My concern is as a grant writer that organizations will be somehow penalized because they have the resources to invest in a grant writer. So how will that information be used by by um, panelists? I'm going to take the easy road, and I'm going to ask Kimberly if she's okay. going to jump in the nuance with you. The easy road has no role okay. in ranking. Yeah. It was a request of our board for information because there was a lot of conversations, and I think the context of it was equity. Like some organizations have enough money to hire a grant writer. It's not scored. But the elected officials in our jurisdiction asked to just be made aware. Yeah. So it's not going to have any role in the rating, but it was a request that we accommodated to just ask the question. But do you want to... Okay. Yeah, I guess I would just be cautious to not penalize organizations that do invest in grant writers. Um, just a comment. Um, then the other is, it was great to see the ranges of awards that would be awarded. Is it possible to also give an estimate number that would be awarded, or is that just too hard to determine in each of those tiers? So I'm hanging with your nuance. Um, uh, the reason why we included the September, October hearing was to answer that question. Okay. Because we don't know. Yep. Okay. And we felt, based on the lesson learned before in the rush, that it put elected officials and CBOs in a tough position to fight over not enough information, enough time. So that will be answered in the materials we present. We will have the applications in front of us. We will look at the core conditions, the different tier sizes, and we will be able to bring that back to a public hearing to your body and to the board to look at to determine what that means. We will be asking if there's additional direction at that time. For example, whoa, there's 10 times the amount of applications in this core condition and there's only two times the amount over here. The elected bodies can direct us to say, I want the money to be proportioned this way based on, that's all up to you as the elected officials, but you didn't have that opportunity before because we didn't have this hearing before the recommended awards. Okay, makes sense, thank you. So um, one more piece about the RFP. Again, great to see that there's different types of evaluation. We're not just counting how many did you serve, but really looking at impacts made. Um, and great to see that there's a client satisfaction survey that we will be supplying. The question is, um, so I think it's great and, uh, is there flexibility for organizations to tweak that so that it is culturally responsive and you know meets the needs of the clients that they're serving? I don't know that that's going to be necessary, but is that possibility there for organizations? The flexibility within the way the scope's written. Uh, with the survey, we actually are using a survey this year as well um, okay. that we uh, put together. Some organizations actually. I think seem to have, find it useful that we provided something, and so we would just continue that. So we have sort of apples to apples as we're reporting out. Okay, got it. Um, and then to the mayor's points, this was a piece that really struck me as well. Um, I'll get into our prevention questions and concerns, but um, now that we are um, proposing to explicitly name and, and put aside shelter and prevention, well, shelter, let's stick with shelter to address um, homelessness, which is amazing and wonderful. I've been very protective of core funds, and I understand the realities of federal and state um, restrictions, so, I th so I'm in support of this direction. But now that we have this as a, a sort of a, a separate proposed, um, it sort of feels like it gives permission for other jurisdictions to continue to not participate at the same level that the county and the city are. I mean, the county is is committing, uh, what is it, 1.5? For, for the, the proposed 1.5 million carve out? Right. It would be 750,000 okay, towards right. the shelter and all 500 towards the prevention program. So the, the, so the county is making a commitment to this. Awesome. The city is being asked to make a commitment to this. And 
I understand that the city's dollars will be going to services in the city, um, but then the county's dollars are going to be going to jurisdictions that aren't giving that match that the city is, if you're following. So it's a concern and I think a question, um, what, what actions can we take through the Housing for Health, perhaps board policy, um, to go back to the cities and ask, um, you know, do we, if, if we need to separate out from core, we separate out from core, but we ask, okay, you're not participating in core, we get it, all the reasons, but now we're talking about housing and homelessness, and homelessness is not a county issue, it's not a city issue, right? We've had this conversation. Um, it's a whole, whole area, region, state issue. So how are our partner jurisdictions financially helping contribute? to this issue. Um, so so I, I don't expect you to have an answer, but that's, that's maybe it'll turn into a direction, but it's an ask that we explicitly ask other jurisdictions to do that match that the city is doing. Oh, Mayor. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, all politics are local, um, and I think I'm speaking to a body who Volunteers. you, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think they're my, I mean, I have to lean into my 30 years in the safety net, but recognize my newness to um, homeless. I never oversaw a homeless office as a county person, and I was really mad at the homeless office in the county as a county person. And now I over the homeless office, I'm like, oh my God, this is a mess. <laughs> so I think a lot of this is education. I think that there are misunderstandings, and I'm not being euphemistic, it's literally a misunderstanding, at least out the gate that because most safety net programs are run by federal and state money and budgets and fall into county, my experience in the last few years is all the cities, yourself included, sort of understandably at first say, well, then therefore homelessness is county, right? And actually then when you look at the funding and the jurisdictions, mm -hmm. it's actually really complicated. And when you look at the way the feds have set up governance policy, they don't say it's a county or a city or state, they say it's a COC. Right. And then when you go to the state of California, who knows what a COC is? They say it's everybody. And there's like 12 departments funding everything and you have this funding maze. And then the money can go to tribes, it can go to nonprofits, it can go to cities and go to counties. Look at the home care grants. And city of Salinas is one of the biggest cities leaning in. They didn't wait for Monterey County. So it's not clear who's responsible. So back to local. Look, I'm in front of an elected body and your city manager. We have had countless conversations, city manager's office, my CIO, who's my boss, and me with staff, 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 staff. We have as much influence as we have to effectuate the concept you're bringing forward. In the end of the day, we don't have authority over those jurisdictions. Yeah. If I may add to that, um, I think um, Mr. Morris has characterized it very clearly. Um, I do want to add just some additional context. So all of the jurisdictions within the county do contribute towards emergency shelter through that COC. Mm -hmm. The challenge is it's woefully inadequate mm -hmm. to meet the needs we have regionally. Um, so I understand your line of questioning, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, and we would welcome further discussion with the other jurisdictions, with the Housing for Health Board and our COC around how we could achieve a more equitable contribution towards this collective need we have around emergency shelter, understanding that we've been cobbling together one-time funding to really stand up these programs and they're at risk longer term. Um, so the proposal in front of you helps further that cause, but it still falls significantly short of the total funding we need to sustain the shelters that we have stood up, including the ones that the county is working on uh, throughout the region. And thank you for that. And the other place to fall short is our prevention and upstream. So I think one of the reasons why we've been successful, the 29% decrease isn't by accident, right? We've invested, we've worked really hard, and we've held both ends. We have done, I, I, we have partners who uh, are currently getting over 100,000, I hope that we'll be speaking later, um, in prevention and you know housing stability resources, and we've managed to stand up emergency shelters. We've held both ends, and that's why we are have shown some success and direction in the right area. So now we're saying we're gonna um, disinvest, like divest that prevention and upstream because we're solving for this crisis, which I know that we need to do. Um, 
I, I guess the point I'm trying to get at is if other cities match like we are matching, then those that 500,000 for prevention can be spread across the jurisdictions and we won't be back to square one without the, the, the you know, investment in prevention and upstream. I'm, I'm really, really feel strongly and the, hopefully we'll have a longer um, discussion about this. I feel strongly that we not let go of that. Um, so let me, okay. And then I have just two more questions. Well, I just, with humility, um, but I balance that with feeling at this stage in my career, I need to lean into things that I see. I think there's a bifurcation needed. Locally, this is a small enough community compared to many, where I have to think if staff to staff cannot effectuate the change you're naming carefully in front of an elected body, maybe this is an elected discussion between electeds. What I would say is, having come here and been hammered by your former mayor, former District 3 supervisor, now did not run, despised the former COC structure because he complained, and I think rightly so, it seemed like a magic black box where decisions were being made that were public. We have shifted that, and I'll get to what this is locally, to be Brown Act governed, transparent, to have city and county seats, nonprofits, lived experience. That is a body that the Fed say is the place to have homeless policy discussions. That body is staff and electeds. That body in our humble little pond of Santa Cruz County is a place to educate and talk and pressure and push to have more collective impact and deeper investment and not the finger pointing. Number two, um, this is, I've seen the cycles enough at this stage of my career. This is not gonna get solved without change in federal and state policy. And if I may say, as a member of the jurisdiction of CSAC, California State Association of Counties, and you are members of California League of Cities, it's systemic that the city, Calif your state association and ours do not agree on who's responsible for what. We have a systemic problem that leaves counties and cities fighting. And if we can't get the state in our state association systemically, I've told Matt many times, I don't care who's responsible. You just name it and then fund it. Mm -hmm. There is nothing else that I run in the entire human services department that is not clearly in my lane and clearly has federal and state money with clear mandates. Homeless policies, nobody's telling us what to do. It's, and when we fight, the state and feds are off the hook, result stepping in. So I would just say locally, let's lean into the COC, carefully, respectfully, lean into your role and talk to your elected colleagues and the jurisdictions. We'll continue as staff but let's keep trying to figure out how to get our state associations to come together with a plan, because right now, our state associations disagree on who's responsible. CSAC says it's, if it's in a city, the city, and the city say, no, it's county. It's a mess. Thank you, I've taken up a lot of time. I just have one more question for now. Um, how are we, um, just the point you were making earlier, Mr. Morris, how are we communicating with the organizations that are currently funded that, um, that this isn't, that they may not get funded and how are we helping them plan for sustainability because that was one of the issues last time. Um, so we have an email group that all currently funded agencies are kept apprised of this. They're given a ping and an alert whenever there's an elected meeting, they're getting a ping to the materials and the effort to move this up six months was in part to create more runway. I feel like I need to be really candid given we don't have enough money. I mean, in an ideal world, you'd say keep funding everybody who's doing good work and then please add to the pot. Given we don't have a bigger pot, elected officials can choose not to put it out to bid, but if you do, there's gonna be winners and losers, and the losers who lose funding, we've tried to create a six month runway, and we tried our best last time to find alternative funding, but that's the problem. If there was alternative funding, it would be funded. We have very sophisticated CBOs, and I've heard a couple really quality grant writers <laughs> who go after money. And there's just not a lot of money there. So the six month lead time in the open communication is um, an improvement from last time, but it still doesn't solve the issue that if certain programs who have programs going don't win and get recommended and ultimately elected bodies don't overturn it, um, there's more transition time. Councilmember Watkins. Uh, thank you for the questions, and I appreciate them because I had similar type questions. I also, um, well, let me just start by also saying thank you for your hard work and 
getting to this to this place. I know we're on the the questions are around the homeless for me specifically, but I don't want that to um, overshadow a lot of collaborative improvement that we're also seeing here today. So I just want to make sure that's really clear. <laughs> so thank you for that. I think that's going to go a really long way with the community, and I appreciate your hard work in that way. I think where the confusion came for me, and I think um, if I'm hearing correctly from my colleagues, is around how this has been a partnership with the county and city, and our unique partnership has led to a sharing of funds for a collective impact, which is, I think is a really great thing. Um, and we are the only other jurisdiction in the in the county who's doing that. And so having it be sort of divided, county, city, collective, similar process, I think that's that's sort of the, the kind of the mindset we're going into. Where I think I found confusion and sort of agree with some of the questions that have been asked around having this um, specific funding allocation get moved to a different governing body to see South County, Mid County, and North County receiving the same amount of funding, but only North County having city contribute to that funding amount of the 250000 I think that's what sort of I feel is a little bit unsettling in that proposal. Um, you know, I'll be careful, too, in terms of what I say of the political. I think you, you absolutely uh, nailed it in, in regards to our challenges. Um, but given where we are today locally, I think that's where it doesn't necessarily feel fair, right? If we're thinking about fair, right? If we're sharing the cost of the 250000 yet the county's covering the cost for mid and south, I don't know. I think that kind of feels like where the, there's a little bit of a rub there. I you, see that you, you're well, really excited. <laughs> I, I think this is an excellent democratic discussion that sure. should be aired publicly. Um, in my years, there have been many times where I, as staff, have strongly discouraged bad investments that are jurisdictionally, collectively askew, because that sets a bad precedent that gives a signal to those not leaning in that you can stop leaning in. And that gets balanced with, and I'm, I'm not running for office, <laughs> it's going to sound like a politician, the humanitarian crisis that's getting worse. And so, like I said earlier, uh, I've never overseen a homeless office until three years ago when it moved from the CAO to my shop. I've learned an unbelievable amount, and mostly what I've learned in, is how deep the crisis is, how underinvested it is, and how everyone's pointing fingers and yelling. That reality bumps up against what I'm hearing as your two questions, which I do think it's good policy to sort of get the structure better and get the equal lean in, and that runs a rub with the following. The crystal ball I see, which all I can bring to the table is my experience, is we have a couple of years under the current governor who basically is creating a narrative that much of the state has come to believe that I've solved everything and this is a local problem about accountability now. I don't see more money coming. So we are going to be left with how to toggle between what I think I'm trying to recognize is a very good question and if we don't find a way to put general fund, and I'll just be county-centric, if we, because we have a strategic plan to try to stand up three navigation centers across the region, if we don't lean in now, I'm worried the window will close. CBOs are going to start stepping away because we're not going to It's too unstable. Mm -hmm. So it's a balancing act. So I'm trying to recognize I think that's a righteous issue, and I encourage you to lean into your elected colleagues. And I, as staff, given I have this homeless office now. I don't enjoy it, by the way. This is our best window. And we're also going to add some Measure K money, too, to collectively put some of our tax initiative and our core money, if approved. And then we have some base funding to actually start to be more competitive and use that as leverage to build Medi-Cal. If we don't have that base funding, I'm worried this window will close while we wait to try to get four cities to equally contribute. That's the tension. I, I totally get it. I, I do. I think what... Um, you know, and I don't envy your your role or your position. I, I think you were handed a very challenging uh, job for all the reasons you mentioned. So it's not anything to do with that. I think what it has to do with is sort of just this history of the city of Santa Cruz disproportionately taking on a lot of the impacts associated with our unhoused population and the services provided here. And so there's a history there. And then also being on the H4H and, and 
the decision making and who's at the table and who's not at the table. Last I remember the policy team not having representation from all of the jurisdictions. I think deferring that decision to that entity also sort of feels like a little bit not, I'm not clear on it basically. So I guess what I, I can say is I don't really understand that. I think um, that's where that's a little bit where I feel a little bit confused about the recommendation beyond like core I get like I got core I get core I think this piece I feel like I get conceptually where you're trying to go with it by saying hey we need to do this a little bit differently because of all of the circumstances you described I understand that but it feels like kind of challenging to kind of think about that in terms of how we've um, proceeded with core in the past and have up until this agenda report have kind of perceived how core would move forward to now this sort of new deviation specifically for the homeless funding. So can I can I offer two pieces of information that may or may not be responsive? Um, this is very nuanced, I understand. Um, number one, the current slate of core contracts, just shy of $900,000 go into the core condition of um, affordable housing and shelter. So we're sort of not like taking money, we're just sort of repurposing it to be more aligned because we think we'll have deeper impact if it's more aligned with the other federal and state funding streams. No, I, I understand and, that. And number two, I'm gonna to try to be very careful here because I wanna channel what I heard from our former District 3 Supervisor Coonerty and your council on video, that there was, as I took it, direction for the county to lean in more to not just fund services in North County because then there's this magnet effect. Sure. whether that's true or not. So one of the things we, and I remember this being coming up in core and the, the seated council at the time, which is, as I recall, you made the decision you wanted some of your city contribution if it went to the entire county, including the city center, because you don't want all, like a kind of a service ghetto. So that was the, the direction we got in, in, in that vein. We as the county who do run the COC, do have access to money, do have arguably a little better ability to leverage Medi-Cal claiming. We want to invest more regionally in having a more stable ecosystem with shelters across the system as a county role, we don't have enough money. So I think it's a little bit of all of that, and I'm carefully trying to ask back to you all if I heard you last time, which is you actually do see a benefit to spreading the county money, so it's not all focused just here. And whether that's true or not, it's certainly a perception that then attracts people. And I'm being very clear, it might not be true, but that was direction we got from your body last time. So it's a little bit of that thinking where the county's saying we need to invest across the region. There's no, I don't think there's any disagreement there in terms of seeing that and wanting that and ultimately, you know, being available for the people that need navigation services where they reside. Mm -hmm. I think we're also missing a, a huge part of North County combines with just city alone. I think we're missing the valley significantly. There's a huge issue in terms of transportation issues up in the valley to get to the services that they need. I worked on a, a project with a lot of students. so. I'm just, I mean, I think that, sh that should be acknowledged. I mean, North County, I'm assuming you mean the city of Santa Cruz. I in, in the way we've described the materials for the this $1 million? For, yeah, yes. so let me ask Matt and Lauren M. It's it specifically for city, we say North County, South County, Mid County, but it's specifically for city of Santa Cruz, specifically to take your money, our money, braid it together to equally contribute to armory services and housing matters, navigation center service. So specifically city of Santa Cruz. Okay. So it's our misstatement. I think, I mean, I guess maybe the, the, given that, I think maybe that's sort of the, the directed request, right? I think it's just written so vaguely in the agenda report for me to not have it clearly like, this is what we're requesting. I mean, I would implore the county to also look at Valley services specifically as well, but I mean, hey, that's outside We've my lane as well. We've heard. <laughs> hey, We've heard. I'm not trying to overstep. Um, but I, I do think, you know, that should be clear. Because I think that's a different kind of discussion as opposed to sort of more general terms. And council member, this again is why we proposed this extra hearing before recommended awards, because we will have in the materials we bring forward what's being proposed, combined program, core condition, and region. Right. And it creates, a, and then this is more of a board issue because that's not your jurisdiction, but it's an opportunity for the elected officials okay. to sort of give direction. And they could give direction, say, I want some money dedicated to our District 5. Um, that's all options at the next public hearing. So I'll move on then from that. I think then if H4C, H4H makes the recommendation, does this come, that recommendation come before the city council before its final approval? I have an answer, but do you want to go on that first? You want me to just keep go going? Um, yes. Okay. So the, what it really means 
is the CBOs would know 1.5 million is not available in the core procurement. 1.5 million would still go to CBOs to still deliver services to the populations that increasingly are unhoused. Um, but the procurement process would happen through the COC. And then to your question, before any money is appropriated, it has to come back to the bodies that appropriate okay. the money. So then we would come back to the board and to your council to say, hey, that thing, member back on April 3rd, da, 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 and then you would be able to weigh in on it. Okay, great. That was one of my questions. And then Mid-County, if I heard you correctly in your presentation, you didn't mean like the city of Capitola, you meant unincorporated um, area. Yeah, it's in District 1, Supervisor Koenig's district. We have an application in a funding stream called Behavioral Health Bridge, and we have funding for it, and that is going to be our Mid-County Navigation Center. I don't know if you have the address specifically. By Harbor High. Uh -huh. uh, but anyhow, that's been identified as the site that we're leaning into to try to stand up. And that is because of the funding stream, particularly for people with behavioral health issues because of the funding stream. But again, we need some local money to sort of leverage some of that Medicaid I'll just, money. I'll just make a observation that's literally right outside this, the city boundary, yeah. just so you know. <laughs> so I mean, I think in terms of the shared services, certainly like wanting to see that, but that's like really, really close to the city of Santa Cruz. I don't know if I would classify that as Mid County personally, but I'll leave it at there. That's my questions. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. If I may just uh, um, add a little additional context to what uh, Mr. Morris was um, discussing regarding regarding the contributions that the city and the county are proposing. Um, I hear you, Councilmember Watkins, with regards to our contribution and how that looks optically with the rest of the region, the other jurisdictions that um, are not making that same commitment. Um, but we saw it as an opportunity. It's 10% of our total core funding that we would be committing to a facility that is in the city of Santa Cruz that we're working to solve for from a financial sustainability standpoint and in kind have an additional net new $250,000 that's coming from the county towards that same program okay. that does not exist today. That was that. I so I, I hear you okay. in terms of wanting to see greater equity of contributions across the region, but we're really leveraging a new $250,000 that will go towards our armory operations along with our contribution. Um, it wasn't conditioned on the county providing that commitment, but we saw it as an opportunity to leverage and work in partnership and ideally be more successful going after other grants and state funding. I just apologize if I misread that in the agenda report. It just was not clear to me. Sure. Appreciate, I appreciate the clarification. Council Member Brenner. I, so at this point, my questions have been answered. Thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate that we're all on the same um, thought process here with questions and input. Um, and I know that you know we have a financial responsibility and we want to be fiscally responsible so um, in in deciding um, this aspect of it um, I think this this has been really interesting to read through the three options you know after reading through the 59 pages of core and kind of you know this is an ever-evolving process that um, has had a lot of work and massaging and um, you know, we're trying our best to meet a lot of needs, and um, I'm happy that we're coming up with improved uh, systems and collective impact. So um, I'll just leave it there. Thank you for <laughs> asking the questions, and um, I'll pass it on. Brown is recognized. Oh, I'm going to save my comments until after a motion is made, um, and I do have comments. But I, I wanted to ask a couple of questions, and I appreciate the conversation that's gone on here because it um, has kind of helped me think through my own sense of you know of how the proposal to carve out funding for homelessness, um, housing, and homelessness kind of fits into the, the bigger picture. I will say what I see is, and, and I support that, I, because I think that these are critical services. Um, and one of the things that worries me so much about CORE is that it, um, you know, it really leaves uh, community-based organizations, uh, you know, 
really subject to the vagaries of panels and um, who gets who has the grooviest application. Some you know, and the 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 worries about these critical safety net services um, being eliminated because you didn't make a good application in a funding round. It's just something. That, I mean, it it really has kept me up at night as we have gone through this process. Um, and so I I support carving out. Um, pretty much anything that's a critical safety net service from core at this point and if that means reducing the core budget well so be it I've always fought for more money to go into community programs um, I guess I'm veering into the comments phase but I do want to say uh, because this is not a comment about this this but it's a comment about the conversation that's been happening here um, you know I'm real okay with the city putting in more than our partner jurisdictions if because the politics of those jurisdictions, I mean, we can't change that. You know, we certainly can make, um, you know, make our our feelings known and and do you know work whatever networks we have to try to make that happen. But it just hasn't. And for forty years, the county and city have said we're going to put money into community programs, and other jurisdictions simply have not. And so, and where they have put some money in and, and not put it in the core process, it's such a limited amount of funding. I think that mostly that's why they haven't wanted, you know, it's $5,000 in Scotts Valley or whatever it is, you know, how is, and, and they're going to have no say, what does that do for core, right? So I haven't really been as concerned about that question. Um, I'll also just say um, that the core pot has been shrinking, or the community programs pot over the years. This city used to give $3 million to community programs 20 years ago. So um, we're doing more than our fair share relative to other jurisdictions, but we certainly aren't doing, um, you, you know, as much as certainly I would like to see. So, which leads me to my first question. It's really kind of an open question. Um, you know, you mentioned, and I'm glad you clarified that some of the that the county measure K funding will also be dedicated to this because I do worry that we're basically shifting core money, which I support, um, for homelessness and housing. Um, but that means that it's a it's a much smaller pot for the organizations that expect to you know at least compete for access to those funds. Um, and and so I'm, I'm I guess I'm wondering why are we not talking about increasing the general fund contributions on you know we just passed a sales tax measure here as did the county um and and now i think is a good time to try to find some additional dollars to put into um this this um program area um so that's it's kind of, i guess it's kind of a rhetorical question but i would ask um about you, you know at your end the county and what conversations you said mentioned that some money additional money is going to go in i don't know um the details of that be great to hear how much and if we've thought about that at all at this end. I can speak to city real quickly and I appreciate the question, Councilmember Brown. Um, so um, we have had the functional equivalent of increasing our general fund contributions towards homelessness response. And in fact, in fiscal year 25, we will have completely exhausted our one-time funding that we received from the state and feds through COVID which means that our general fund has inherited those costs to sustain them going forward. Um, and of course, the our sales tax measure, our, our half cent increase is going into the general fund and is helping to cover those increased expenses. We'll talk more about that when we bring the budget forward. Uh, it, and it is partly contributing to why when we bring the budget, you'll see that we have, we're projecting about a $1.8 million deficit for the next fiscal year that we're working we're working on covering it in a number of ways so uh, more details on that to come thank you i have a couple of questions could i just okay I make, thank you um and and yeah. i i knew that i just wanted to ask everyone and i want yeah mr morris thank you well mindful of the two hats you wear um from a county perspective we have our measure k and then we have our general fund i want to start with general fund um an unintended consequence of the benefit of pushing this process up six months is we are having a conversation in the fiscal year prior when we were about to adopt our budget for next fiscal year when the core money doesn't get effectuated until two fiscal years. So from a county general fund perspective, and I want to be very, very careful not to speak inappropriately for our county general fund, but next fiscal year is when the county board of supervisors will decide how much money to appropriate into the core bucket. So we have just put the materials forward as if it maintains as is, but then that ends up being a budget decision next year. 
because this next fiscal year will be year three of the three-year procurement where you and we have appropriated our general fund. But we're having this conversation earlier for the reasons described, so we have to have the budget discussion on general fund next year. The careful part is I don't want to mislead the CBOs to think that we'll have more money because in the ideal world, then you could just backfill the money that was pulled to put to this dedication and then have more money. But that's a conversation for next year when we're looking at a future of limited funding. So, and then number two is Measure K. It's been made public that of the county's anticipated $10 million of new revenue that would come in, $1 million will be focused on affordable housing and $1 million would be focused on shelter. Our analysis, which I didn't get into because I want to be mindful of how complex this stuff is, is even with a portion of that a million Measure K and this, if approved by your council as well, it's still not enough, but it begins to position us to be more like some of the other bigger jurisdictions that have more general fund flexibility to invest more in this. And then we are positioned to be more, um, we're not gonna miss the window. There's still gonna be more some, some more state and federal grants in the near future. And now is the time to show federal and state funders, we actually are putting skin in the game, mindful of the discussion about the other jurisdictions. So I think there is gonna be, in addition, some Measure K conversations. You probably know at our board, there's been a big push to have it be prevention, prevention, prevention. But I think we will have to have that conversation when Measure K plays out. We'll be in front of the board in June to have the discussion about Measure K, but it will be a portion of it also to augment some of the shelter funding. Thank you, that's helpful to think about the the numbers you're giving us being a placeholder here and it, the anticipation of um, changes would come later. My other questions are um, a question, and I may have follow-up, related to this proposal for a, an elected official carve-out of 15%. Um, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around how that would play out given the limited role that elected officials have in um, reviewing applications, not being able to see the applications. I'm not going to even try on that one, but I do believe we should be able to. We could for 40 years, and nobody ever complained about it, and so now we're fixing a problem I never was aware existed in our community. But um, since we can't see them, uh, how will we determine what those needs are? How would an elected body go about figuring out what to do with the that 15% set aside? What will that process look like? Just um, even generally. Yeah, so generally I, I do feel responsible to make this comment carefully, but honestly. I have had over a dozen, probably close to two dozen community-based organizations come forward and tell me the story that makes it in this new community that you are a member of, that there was never any problems with the former community programs is a lie. <gasps> and let I'm me, let me, no, I just want to message what I'm hearing. Okay. The CBO said under the Human Care Alliance structure was a bloodbath amongst themselves where they worked very hard to stay lock and step when they became public, but privately it was a racket that benefited a few and nobody could penetrate to come in. But I just want to do my job to share that this narrative that I've heard is does not, it matches a couple of the bigger voices. From an equity perspective, it completely is the opposite of what a majority of CBOs have told me privately that they've never felt safe to say. I just want to say that I feel like that's my responsibility. Number two, the way it would look is this was yet to your point about reading applications. It is an oxymoron to have a public procurement where elected officials are in the middle of the process when there's an appeal process. It's a choice. I wasn't here. Community programs was not an RFP. Community programs was a kind of a soft RFP. It was like, oh, put some app. Is the same organizations got funded and how much more and let a few other enter. It wasn't a specific procurement process. So if it's going to be a procurement process, the procurement process is to leave to staff to hire panels. And look, I'm not leaning in on this more than I should, but the CBOs that lost money probably are the ones who called the grand jury. We were named a role model in transparency. That doesn't mean we funded the right agencies. What it means is that process was steeped with integrity. So my point is this. We created the extra hearing before the recommended awards come forward because it's a unique procurement to stay within the procurement box, to give elected officials a chance to lean in and give us direction to carve out, to prioritize this, pick District 5, but it, and a 15% set aside money so that when this, to your question, when this comes back, if your council and the board are willing to accept the recommended awards, your 15% of your 1 million is up to you 
to then, because of, you've approved this process, to say that 15% is this amount of money. I want mm -hmm. it to fund that agency or that agency. Or you still retain the right to override it and say, I don't want our money going there. I want to override that. So that's kind so of the dance. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm still confused because I, and I, when I, we, we're going to disagree about the, we'll just have to agree to disagree on core, you know, the history of this. My point was not about the process being perfect. There was never anybody concerned before. My point was that ev everyone, including the general public, got to see the applications that CBOs submitted to the city and county. Um, and I never heard anybody say we're you know, that makes us nervous. I, I was I've been involved with the Human Care Alliance, with CBOs in this community for 30 years almost, and so I, I don't think anybody was afraid to tell me what a piece of their mind. Perhaps now that I'm on the council, maybe, but not. I'm just I'm just saying there was not a complaint that um, from CBOs that they felt like that information needed to be private. And so the insistence that it's in, that there's a problem there is just something that I, I just disagree with. I was not trying to say this the whole there weren't problems with the, the process. Uh, my question still is how would we go about deciding what groups to fund? We'll just get a list and it'll be like here's who got funded, here's their rankings. Here's the ones that didn't get funded. What do you guys want to do? Um, so I'm, I'm just I'm trying to just understand how we effectively will 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 execute that piece of the of so the you puzzle. have three opportunities to weigh in and give direction. One is that September October hearing where we will bring forward to you a full analysis of what has come in by region by program by core condition. At which point both elected bodies can say before you bring back recommended awards, I want you to focus on this or this or this or this region, and we will bring that back and incorporate it into the recommended awards. Then when we come back with recommended awards, there'll be a slate of recommended awards, which bite number two at the apple, you have full authority to say yes or no or I don't want it. And you will have a 15% bucket of money if you approve this. That will then be at your discretion to deliberate what to do with to fill in gaps, emerging needs, or say, I don't like that that agency didn't get recommended for it. I'm okay with that as long as we vote to then fund that agency. So those would be the, and those are all new, and those none of those are part of normal RFP processes because of the unique history of this particular procurement and how limited the money is. Thanks. You got to what I was going to say is that with that 15%, in a sense, you'd have that discretion to fund an organization that wasn't recommended for funding. You could also choose to um, even, you know, we have the ability to trim some of the proposed, um, you know, the application so it fits within the budget. You could choose to um, replace whatever we've recommended to trim so that they're fully funded. Like at the time that you have the recommended awards in front of you, you would also have the organizations that were not recommended for award. So you would ha have all that in front of you and you would know who knows what might come up between now and the time we're actually um, doing this next winter. There might be something brand new that collectively you guys and the um, Board of Supervisors feel like is a, a priority that needs to be addressed. Does that help? Yeah, I mean, I, I get the, in theory, how, it, but I, I'm just trying to think about practically how that's going to play out when you have seven members of a city council, you know, mayor and six council members and five members of the Board of Supervisors without being asked to make decisions that panel members were asked with a very clear structure, um, guidelines, uh, rubric, et cetera, and we're going it, it to, just, it's just hard to imagine how that's going to play out, but that's yeah. for another day, I think. Okay. Um, I appreciate the, um, your, you're describing the thought, you know, your thoughts on how it would, what it would look like. Um, it also, go ahead, I well, have one other question. I, I just, related. if you go watch the archive of the board meeting this morning, this discussion played out and the end result was some deliberation like this. And I don't want to put words in the elected officials um, mouth, but basically what they said is we're this far down the road. The RFP structure is a structure. Let's accept that structure. But maybe the next round we need to rethink whether the RFP oh, yeah. structure is the way to go. That's all fine. But this was the direction we got last round and the current round. And, and by the way, we interviewed five of the seven of you seated at the time and four of the five members and unanimously, and maybe people didn't know what they were saying, unanimously we were told do a competitive procurement through an RFP process. So we followed that instruction. I, I, it's, I, again, I'm not, quite, I'm not um, going after the, the process right now. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to make this work 
th this particular proposal and the, with the changes. And I appreciate that the, all of this has been done in response to lessons learned. Um, so I know you you have a very different perspective on the value of core, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm just trying to figure out how we are going to, you know, do what you know in mm -hmm. practice at this dais when the time comes, how that happens without, you know, a, a, some kind of structure for us. So um, my last question, which is related, is how will and they'll just so. The, the city council will make some decisions about a carve out and the county board of supervisors will make decisions. The total amount of the carve out is listed in our, our summary report, but are you intending to, the, the city's share, well, the city will make decisions about and the county share, they'll make decisions about, again, just trying to imagine how we do this. So I think maybe the terminology, um, the one of the options in the recommendation was, was that you have an option to tell us a carve out. Like last time there was a, a carve out for the senior home, home delivered meals. This time, so that's an option, but that is separate from the 15% that we have set aside. So those would, in a sense would be two separate things. Um, there was no direction for any carve out this morning. So it was just an RFP. Did, and they did um, approve the 15% set aside as recommended. So um, as we've been talking up to this point, it, you have this array of choices today and as we move forward. With that, if, we just, if we're just talking about the 15%, in, in a sense, you, you are right that as with all of CORE, we, never, we don't know what applications we're going to receive. Um, so as we go through this, we come back with what we've got, we get feedback, and we propose recommendations. Once we have a better idea of what we're even looking at, um, then, we'll, then there, there may be options for how, you, how the, that 15% is spent. We might be getting feedback at the check-in, you know, in, in the fall of how it's done. And I think that it's almost hard to determine exactly how it will play out until we're there. But it would be, it, it, let's say theoretically, if there was, if, if the board and the council parted ways on how to use that discretionary fund, I imagine that um, the amount of funding in that pot would be, we would uh, break it up proportionally, you know, based on what proportion was from the seating, what proportion was from the board. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And sorry, I was using carve out, but I meant set aside. <laughs> Thank you. Further questions by the board? Thank you very much. Oh, excuse me. Oh, please, Ms. Collintar Johnson, please. So, um, I'm trying to understand our decision-making process. The, the county supervisors um, approved the recommendation and went with option one. Could, Correct. This well, morning they did, or so, this after, early afternoon. So what would happen if the city didn't do the same thing, just process-wise? I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen, but how does that work? Um, like, well, let's say we went with a different option rather than option one. Yeah, so this gets back to the complexity of rating funding. So the county voted on the county's contribution, the just shy of $5 million. So the 500000 will move to the Housing for Health to procure for a South County Prevention Program. The county will put two fifty in the Watsonville Navigation Center, the two fifty Council Member Watkins juxtaposed to the City of Santa Cruz uh, that we mislabeled mid-county. And two fifty would go towards... And we would have discussion in the forums where we meet with your city manager's office. And then you, your 250, you have the discretion to not okay. support it. And then you would need to give direction. We might weigh in as staff about the workload and complexity, but I think we'd have to have that conversation. Okay, so we're voting on the city 250 in option one. So the yes, because yes. It's about a little less than a quarter of your contribution, and you would be saying, yes, braid that with what the county recommended this morning. And what that, and I think this was discussed earlier, what that means is the shelter investment is 500,000 North County, 250 in the District 1, 250 in Watsonville, because your 250 is going there, and we would work together on the nuance with the staff and elected, elected, and the one by one to talk about how to proportion that based on the years this rolls out. We'd have that open conversation and come back to the board and council with the specifics once we have a specific plan. 
Ms. Bruner. I just, you know, wanted to clarify for anybody listening, just because the city is now in districts, um, when, when there's reference to District 1, District 3, um, it's referencing county districts versus city districts. So um, I just wanted to clarify that because I know that can be confusing. So thank, thank you so much. Anyone with us today wish to comment on this item? Please come forward. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm Helen Ewan Story. I'm the Assistant Director for the Community Action Board in Santa Cruz County. Appreciate this discussion. Um, it's been very rich. Um, CAB's been the designated anti-poverty community action agency in our county for nearly 60 years, serving over 12,000 diverse low-income individuals through a range of services, including youth and adult employment and mentoring assistance, homelessness prevention and intervention, immigration legal services and advocacy, the Davenport Resource Center up on the North Coast, and special projects including emergency preparedness, response, and recovery, um, along with multilingual public uh, health outreach. And we're also a current uh, core grantee for many of these services. So we want to thank you know, the city and um, county core staff for several of the improvements that have been, uh, been made in the process, as has been noted before. And um, I know this is complex, but you know, in reviewing the, the uh, proposed options the staff has identified, we do support option one. Um, given the persistent housing crisis, both city and countywide, escalating homelessness, um, particularly in South County, but everywhere, we understand the critical need for shelter countywide, as well as for prevention-focused efforts. Um, I think many of you are aware we do a, a biannual um, a community action plan process in our 24-25 uh, CAP plan. 50% of low-income CAP respondents made uh, $20,000 or less last year, and 20% of those who responded to our, our, our plan made less than $5,000 last year. It's pretty stark. So the top identified needs included housing, uh, employment and food insecurity, and physical and mental health needs. So while we understand that option one represents uh, a shift in core funding uh, framework, we support this shift um, due to the high level of need that we've all acknowledged uh, is in this community. Um, and at the same time, we do urge your um, council to consider, I mean, there are new funds coming through uh, Measure L, and I know there's multiple priorities for that. But we do encourage you to look at those funds coming in to see if there can be additional funds shifted into core um, to be able to address the myriad of basic needs, safety needs, um, you know, that low-income community members face so that um, it can be equitably addressed and properly resourced through the core process. So thank you. Thank you, and thanks for the fine work that CAB does. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Cristal Gonzalez, and I serve as a Semitas Director at Ventures. I wanted to express my gratitude for our ongoing partnership as one of the core funded partners. Your support has been integral to the success of the Semitas program. With the core funds provided, we have been able to initiate a transformative effort opening college savings accounts for all the babies born to Santa Cruz County families with an initial deposit of up to $50. As of now, we have over 7,400 babies from Santa Cruz County families have a Semitas College Savings Account, and we have invested over $800,000 towards children's savings accounts. This has been possible with only two and a half staff. Semitas serves families across Santa Cruz County, with approximately 35% of them being from Santa Cruz. Most of these families are eligible for Medi-Cal through collaborative efforts with our partners, and thanks to funding through CORE, these families can have up to $500 in their child's account by the age of five. We have successfully leveraged core funds to garner additional support from partners. Contributions are made to these accounts upon completion of milestones, such as annual dental visits, immunizations, wellness checks, financial literacy workshops, and positive parenting classes. Additionally, our collaboration with the state's college savings account program, CalKids, 
further amplifies our outreach efforts. As a first generation student myself, I understand firsthand the transform transformative power of education. Semitas embodies the belief that education is unattainable for everyone, regardless of background. Core funding is not, not only enables us to give back to the community, but also to foster a culture of possibility and empowerment. Once again, I extend my gratitude for your continued partnership and support, and I anticipate the opportunity to further straighten our collaboration and continue making a positive impact in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else who is with us today wish to make comment? Do we have anyone online? We'll take the person online. Good afternoon and welcome. Hello, thank you very much. This is Reverend Beth Love with Eat for the Earth. Eat for the Earth is a, a nonprofit that is uh, located in Santa Cruz County, California. And we provide a lot of different services to help people regain or to maintain their health through dietary change. Um, we are very grateful to the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz for core funding that we've had in this current round. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish with that. We have a, a cutting edge program. It was, uh, it's been so successful and effective with the Latino community that we were actually asked to speak about it at a very prestigious um, national conference, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Our results, I think, speak for themselves. It's a very short immersion program where we pack in a lot of nutrition education. We give people recipes, we give them diet tips. We test them at the beginning and the end for biometric markers such as glucose, uh, cholesterol, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, blood pressure, et cetera. And what we find is in two short weeks, um, a ra remarkable things can occur, especially for those who are very compliant but regardless of compliance, 95% of our people experience improvement in at least one biomarker. In um, the fiscal year that we did finish, uh, we don't have all the numbers crunched for this fiscal year, but it's looking really actually better. In the first fiscal year of the program, we had an average reduction in total cholesterol of 14%, an average reduction of LDL cholesterol of 22%, and this is just within two weeks. We also had 60% of the people who walked in the door with diabetes two weeks later had normal glucose levels. So we're making a big difference for, for these people and for their families. We're partnering with local healthcare providers such as Salud Parlante and um, some local um, nonprofits as well. And we so appreciate having your funding and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing with this process. It's, it's been a very significant change for us to be able to offer this program. And we have been able to leverage additional funds by having the core funding. And um, we're, we're, um, we're, we're looking forward to continuing to partner with the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz in the core funding initiative. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi, thank you much. It's Clay Kemp from the Seniors Council Area Agency on Aging. Uh, I've been involved in community programs since 1990 with three different organizations. And I actually miss the partnership that we used to have that I think is, has deteriorated over recent years. Uh, it seemed like not only the city and county used to work together, but all jurisdictions did along with nonprofits. And we tried to figure out how to improve our services to the community. That was our focus. It, it was really results-based. And we spent far less time on the process that we did the results. And I think part of what we've lost is there was a time when the county did formal monitoring of all the recipient agencies, and that resulted in a report that came back to the county and to the cities where there was a full analysis of whether or not these dollars were well spent or effective. Today, we don't do that anymore. Instead, we put hundreds of thousands of dollars into the process, which results in zero dollars. So I would love to see us move more towards that partnership that we formerly had where we're really looking at the pros and cons of the services. And part of that, and part of what I am happy to hear about the new proposal, is that flexibility for electeds 
to look at programs that lost money and consider restoring funds there. I think if that had been in place the last several years, we would not have resulted in child care programs being completely defunded through core or programs that protect seniors in nursing homes from being defunded. Uh, the latter is something that my agency has spent an inordinate amount of time trying to sustain and maintain and push back on the state for a mandated service for the past year because of, again, one of those unintended consequences. So anything we can do to be more thoughtful and I think more engaged is really going to help us move forward. Uh, in that spirit, I would also call out that the tiered system, I think that needs to go. Um, I don't see any benefits that it provides. It'll, it adds several layers of bureaucracy to the applicants. And I do know of a couple of agencies that applied in more than one tier for different programs. And interestingly enough, even though they had the exact same administrative proposal, word for word, in each of the tiers, they got very different scores. So by having these multiple tiers, we're only confusing the process and creating poor results. So um, hopefully we can move forward to working together and addressing this issue. I think all of us have the same goal. We wanna make a better community for everybody that lives here. And that's been uh, a relationship that um, I've really been proud of and happy to be part of over the years. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else online? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hello, city council members. My name is Mary Matanayala, and I'm the Senitas Program Coordinator here at Adventures. I am here today to express my appreciation for our partnership with CORE. With the support of CORE funding, we have been able to successfully work towards our goals of improving childhood development, building expectations for higher education, and building dedicated savings and healthy lifelong financial habits. The high cost of college makes many students from a lower income background feel like higher education is out of reach. However, children's savings accounts can put post-secondary education within reach by enabling kids to build college savings and raise their educational expectations. With our partnership with CORE, every child born in Santa Cruz County has an equal opportunity um, of obtaining post-secondary education. Studies show that children with a college savings account of just one to $500 are three times more likely to go to college and four times more likely to graduate from college. From our community workshops, we have seen the impacts that Miitas is having in the lives of Santa Cruz County families. Families are slowly changing their aspirations for their children and expecting their child to receive a master's degree. Um, some also express a sense of relief as they have not been able to start saving for their child's future education. Therefore, I'm here to convey and represent the gratitude of many Semitas families for your partnership. I look forward to the continued impact Semitas will keep having with your support. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Council meeting. <laughs> Good afternoon, City Council and community members. My name is Rigoberto Estrada, and I serve as the program coordinator of Familias Con Mas at Ventures. Today, I'm honored to share with you the impactful achievements of Ventures through our ALAS program made possible by CORE. Thanks to the support, our ALAS program has been, has been in, instrumental in serving 60 unduplicated families, primarily those with household incomes below 65,000, including from Santa Cruz. We address the needs underbanked rural low wage earner communities of color, ensuring equitable access to essential resources and opportunities through monthly workshops, 375 one-on-one -on -one financial coaching sessions and stipends, emphasizing that intergenerational impact of all families served as children under 18. Leveraging funding, we collaborated with Monarch to serve an additional 15 women survivors of violence. Our partnership with the UCSC Blunt Center has further enhanced our efforts leading to research on the impact to the families. We eagerly anticipate sharing these findings with you in early 2025. We are proud to announce that we will commence two new cohorts totally, 30 participants in July of this year. Many of our participants have started emergency savings funds for their families and testaments that the program's funds for their 
that the program is affecting this, we urge you to continue to support economic stability. One remarkable example of our impact is Juana, a mother of two who faced vision issues. Through ALAS and this funding, Juana not only received financial support to finally see an eye doctor, but also guidance and education to navigate through the reduction of hours due to storms of 2023. Her journey from uncertainty to empowerment serves as a beacon of hope and inspiration to us, to us all. With all the climate and emergencies, uncertainty, economic stability is a major need of our families, and we ask you to continue to support. We're humbled by the progress made and inspired by the resilience of the communities we serve. We're immensely grateful for your continued support and partnership in funding economic stability services for our families. Thank you for your attention and dedication to creating a brighter future of our residents of Santa Cruz. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good evening. Welcome to the City Council meeting. Good evening. Hello, my name is Cheryl Frenzo and I am the current executive director of the Diversity Center. And um, I, firstly, I just wanted to say um, the core funding was incredibly important to us. This last year, we launched the very, very first free mental health clinic for LGBTQ plus individuals in the county. And we could not have done that without the core funding. We are a learning site. We have a supervisor of MSW students who are studying specifically how to serve the LGBTQ plus community. And we've been able to serve in two locations, both in Santa Cruz and at PVPSA using our mental health clinic as um, uh, a way to offer services throughout the county. And we've been so successful that PVPSA uh, Community Heroes Award is going to our clinical program director for their services and their leadership in this clinic uh, with youth and young adults. So we're really, really pleased. Um, and I want to say thank you so much because honestly, if it were not for CORE, we would not have been able to launch that. Um, I really get the need of, of housing and I really understand why these um, discussions are happening due to our location. We actually serve many unhoused folks um, because uh, we're right next to an empty lot, empty city lot. There's one thing that I have not heard come up either in this discussion or at the Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> I just want to make you all aware that while I don't know all of the nitty gritty details and I don't think any of us totally understand how it's going to unfold, but with the recent vote to diverge MHSA money um, to state in order to also address um, low income housing, uh, there are many of us um, in direct services, uh, the safety net of our community that are bracing for changes in that funding stream as well. We are one of them. Um, so. The, the thought of losing both MHSA money and the thought of losing core money is very uh, scary and concerning. So I, I, I just have to put that out there as well um, because I haven't heard anyone speak to it, but it's, it's a reality for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, anyone else? No one with their hand raised. Matters back before the council. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. I'll make a motion. Um, and I've sent this to Bonnie. Uh, yeah, sorry if my. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll just read it. So, motion to accept and file staff report on the proposed collect collective of results and evidence-based core investment program request for proposal RFP, development and prioritization for the next funding cycle. Accept staff recommendation option one for set aside for affordable housing and shelter and 
direct staff to engage other cities to request a similar match to help solve for our shelter problem. Um, I don't know if you want me to read those details. We'll go to um, item three. Direct staff to explore upstream prevention dollar allocation for City of Santa Cruz residents, either as part of the card out or from, from some other sources um, as part of the core process. Um, and then four, direct staff to coordinate with the Human Services Department to release the finalized version of the core RFP by June 3rd, 2024, including any additional direction from today's hearing, which is um, advocacy with state entities to adjust funding distribution formulas to look at per capita rates rather than um, only population size or pick count numbers. And that would be done through H4H. Uh, and then the last piece is direct staff to report back no later than October 29th, 2024 with a summary of proposals received from our RFP. There is a motion. Is there a second? Councilmember Watkins seconds. You may open on your motion, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Hey. Thank you. Um, I just want to really reiterate my thanks to um, this very deep and complex partnership with the county. Uh, the mayor started off us, uh, started us off and, and said, you know, we, we've worked through a lot. We've come a long way. So I really appreciate how the county um, has come to the table, as the city has come to the table, and it really shows in, in what's brought before us. So really appreciate that. And I want to thank and appreciate the work of the staff behind this this proposal that's before us. I know a lot of hours and a lot of um, thinking out of the box went into it. I also want to thank the CBOs that do the really hard work day in and day out. Um, you know, if you haven't done direct service, it's it's hard to know really what the work entails, and it's it's really hard. It's really challenging, and it's uh, it can be an emotional and, and mental health drain on on our service providers. So I want to thank you for the work you do. I want to thank those of you who came and spoke up, and I want to invite you to please start sustainability planning if you haven't already. Um, you heard today that the resources are finite. Um, we will continue to work on that, but um, not a but. And um, we know you do incredible work. Um, but it's start to start. It's time to start sustainability planning. If you're getting core funding now, please don't count on getting it next time around. Not because you're not doing good work, um, but because we have limited dollars. Um, I'll also just reiterate that that we need to solve for the prevention dollars. So that's why I put that piece in there. I feel really strongly that if we let go of that, we're going to start. We're going to get back to square one. We're going to see that 29% decrease go the other direction. So we really have to work both ends. I know that resources are scarce, but we cannot let go of the prevention piece. It's, it's really, really pertinent to the work that we're doing. Um, and then, um, you know, I want to invite, I doubt any of the other council members from the other cities are watching this, but I want to invite the other elected officials, our colleagues, to please help us solve for this. Um, please, you do come to the table. We, I enjoy working with every single one of you. Please come to the table with dollars um, because we can't do this alone. And I would like to um, ask, that's part of the motion, ask that county and city staff continue to work at the staff level to also have these conversations. Um, I think that's it, really, uh, just in terms of with the other cities. We've worked on other complex issues together. Um, we've done a lot of great work together. So, so let's continue the great work and help solve for this crisis that we have, this humanitarian crisis, as Mr. Morris said, of, of people living on the streets. Thank you. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will... I'm sorry, excuse me, I didn't see your hand. Ms. Brown. I'm just going to say... Um, very quickly, because I, I recognize that, you know, I, in particular on this body, have been um, pretty um, uh, critical. Uh, I'll just say critical of, of this process and, and critical of the um, however intended or unintended consequences of it. Um, but I, I, I don't in any way want that to, um, and I feel like it does a little bit, Randy, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's not about the work you all do. I think, you know, I want to really appreciate the work that you're doing. You have a, a very complex, you know, I think it could be simpler. Um, that's not because of you, but you're working through, uh, you know, a very complex uh, set of questions, uh, networks, decisions, layers, all of it. Um, so I really do appreciate it and, um, and want to 
be, I want you to feel supported um, as, as critical as I am of the kind of process. Um, your work is great. Thanks. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Washington? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Thank you. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all very much. Yeah, Thank you. Coming. Very good work. Mr. City Attorney, is there further business to come before the body? Madam Clerk, Thank motion you. to adjourn would be in order. I don't know what we're going to do without our Vice Mayor. But Mayor, sorry, Mayor, will you just announce again about the... I will do that. I'd be glad to do it. Uh, what uh, Ms. Kalantar Johnson is asking me to do is for those of you that were interested in item 29 relating to the proposed development at the food bin, which was set for 7.15 this evening. That has been continued. It will be heard on May 28th at the City Council. It has been re-referred back to the Planning Commission for further consideration. There is a motion to adjourn. There is a second by Ms. Brown. Non-debatable. Those in favor, reluctantly vote aye. aye. Those opposed, excitedly vote no. <laughs> motion passes. We adjourn. Remember to stay seated until the gavel this time. <laughs> the last two times I've been... <laughs>